to the Kent Lap Podcast. Do you do you mind having the scores um, pop? Pop sound? it. I don't care. Okay. Yeah, we're good on that. I could have yeah. held it up to the mic if that was better. Cheers. Cheers. Welcome. Mm. Mm. There's that. We have it's plenty, like, so if you want more. It's like college. Thanks. Yeah. Exactly, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you are... Um, did you say you're heading out on a van life adventure for a couple of months? Several, Saturday? Uh, several, yeah, this Saturday. So, like, what is that? Make it three days from now? <laughs> yeah. Um, three days from now, my girlfriend and I are going to move into our van, and then it's going to be about six months this time around. Uh, and then, you know, we're going to be here in the summers, which is when, okay. we, when we want to be here. Okay. Um, and then traveling around. We might wind up, like, with a second home base and kind of do, like, a... Three months somewhere, three months traveling, three months here, three okay. months traveling. Like yep. we're kind of getting our lives to where we want it to be. But yeah. I love that. So one of my best friends just went van traveling for months just after he got married. They were all over the West Coast. Nice. And I think they went like north into Canada a little bit. And then they were like 20 miles from... No, nah, they were like an hour from home after months on the road. And they hit a deer and almost killed themselves. <laughs> So don't do that. I'm glad they <laughs> didn't kill themselves. That story had ended. What, uh, what kind that. of van do you have? Uh, it's a, a Ford Transit Connect, which is pretty small, but it was, it was the 2010, which is the last year the, before they started getting smaller. Okay. So it's kind of the biggest of that of the smallest okay. vans that we could get. Um, yeah, my girlfriend and I are, you know, pretty small people and, uh, we don't mean, and we have a four and a half pound dog. Okay. So it's pretty like, yeah. The dog going along too? Oh yeah. Oh yeah? Oh, the dog's fine. <laughs> Did you do the whole thing where you just like totally, you take the van and you rip out seats and you put in like everything. You just start from scratch. Yes and no. Uh, no in the sense that I didn't do that, but okay. my girlfriend did. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. What's her she, name? Casey. Casey. Yeah. Okay. Um, or did, Slash is still doing because there's okay. still some work to be <laughs> yeah. gotten in there. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, she gutted the whole thing. Uh, you know, we went and, and bought a used one and, and gutted it and then um, put in, there's like a floor and uh, and walls with lamb's wool insulating it and a ceiling with, the, she cut out the roof for the fan and then she put solar panels on and then just hooked those up to the battery and the fan and the um, mini fridge and we're working on the sink still and some shelves. We got some shelves. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's still a work in progress. That um, is so cool. Do you have a picture of it on Instagram or something? Or will you? Uh, well, there's definitely... Um, some, if my, my Instagram, I have like where you, you have those collection of stories at the top, you yeah. know, where you can click yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. So I've been trying to remember to put all of the, our, like whenever I take a video of us working on it, mostly her working on it, you know, I hold things while she drills, whatever. Okay. Um, <laughs> then I, I put those things there and then I'm going to, I'm start doing more like once we're in the van and actually living this lifestyle, I definitely am going to try to be better about actually posting more stuff of yeah of van life and and whatnot but yeah fun what uh has this been like a lifelong dream or just come on lately and this is like spur of the moment here we go type of a thing or i mean it it's we started talking about it i guess we've we've talked about doing it in the future at some point but i i can't even remember exactly when it came about i know that before the corona I, in January, I had gone to a comedy festival in Vegas, and then we decided that it would be a good idea for, like, starting in June, that I was going to live in Vegas for a few months, and she was going to go to Boulder, and then we were going to, like, maybe meet up after that or figure out some van life. So I remember we had kind of vague, like, then maybe after that we'll figure out a van, you know, I don't know, but then once the virus happened... Um, our plans started coming together. We were like, well, okay, we're going to throw out the old plans. Yeah. And then, so for the first time in my life, or not in my life, but since I started doing comedy, um, six or so years ago, now time, I don't even <laughs> stop <laughs> keeping track of what anything is. But, um, so with comedy it was always like you, I, I'm going to be doing comedy like four five, six, seven nights a week. And um, and, you know, always wanting to be available for that and like living my whole life kind of around yep. whatever. And so now with the virus, it was like, this is the, this gave me this big relief of like, oh, like I can't 
like do the responsible thing and just ah, stay here. I gave and, you an out. Yeah, I gave you an out. And even yeah. though, you know, I've been doing some comedy the whole time and um, and there are shows here and increasingly more now yeah. and, and whatnot. Still, there's just a break in like the industry. There's a yeah. lot of the festivals just have gotten like delayed a year or two at yeah. this point. Like there's so much of that where it just feels like even with things happening, my career like in, in any kind of scripted way is on hold, which is... Yep beautiful because mm-hmm. like I never wanted to follow the script anyway which is one of the I'm like thanks thanks mama yeah. coronavirus <laughs> because I mean everyone it was it was like you have to move to LA or New York yeah. and um people are miserable in New York for a lot of reasons it's very hard you're I, I've lived there before so it's like standard of living wise it's just a lot of sacrifice and um even then it's not like you're probably going to get like a career just like, Oh, I'm a stand up and I'm going to get right. like, there's this whole thing you have to hassle out. And unless you want to be an SNL writer or that's what you're going for, yeah. then it's, you know, there's not like a clear path to victory. And then LA made more sense for me because not just the weather, but, um, I had more kind of more better connections there a mm-hmm. little bit. And, you know, I was like, maybe I could get into TV or, or something. I don't really want to because and that's, and that's the thing. It's like I don't I didn't want to do Hollywood. But people okay. tell you, like, that's the only way to do your stand up career. Really? Is that you have to, like, get some Hollywood unless you want to be kind of a, you know, like and this is looked down on like a lower level or like just, you know, touring around, like living it, you know, okay. um, living as a poor person for your whole life. Basically. But the Hollywood things gives you like a little bit of a celebrity wear off or something. And that helps your comedy career. Is that this? Yeah, is that the, the Hollywood? I, yeah. Deal? And some people are just using stand up to get into Hollywood. And that's that. Mm-hmm. But for other people, it would be like you get on a TV show or you get on a movie or you get something, you know, or even get become a writer in that in there. And then you network and then people can, you know, gotcha. get, elevate your yeah. career. Yep. But I never wanted to all my you know most of the people who move to LA become miserable um a lot <laughs> there's not a lot of success anyway as, yeah. as Tim Dillon recently put it it's like all these comedians like they think they want a tv show now it's like it's embarrassing to be on a tv show <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what could be worse? So and so now I'm just like it's just I'm I don't say laughing, but a little bit at all my friends who because now it's stand ups. I mean, Joe Rogan has moved here, yeah. and increasingly people are are talking about moving here. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Kyle Canade moved like to Portland. Somebody moved to Nashville. Like uh, people are starting to, and I think Theo Vaughn just, moved to Nashville. Theo Vaughn, yeah. yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah, I saw him running by her office the other day. So yeah. yeah, so I think what's happening is that thank God there's going to be a renaissance of like what we all really want from stand up, which is all like. And all of the cities in the country being like these vibrant places instead of yeah. it being like, OK, all talent, not just with stand up, with everything, all talent has to go to these two cities. Yes. One and a half of which are going to make you miserable. Most yep. people are not going to succeed. And by the way, the people who are going to succeed in Hollywood are going to be mostly the people who aren't that talented. Mm. Maybe they hit a demographic box that we're looking for, but mm-hmm. they're especially going to find the ones who aren't really saying anything challenging to the powers that be. And so that's what's going to get elevated. So it's like the, it was a losing game. Yeah. So now the idea of like the people all like traveling around to cities. That's what stand ups are meant to do. That's what yes. we're supposed to do is really be traveling around and talking and having vibrant scenes all over and, and having everyone live in cities that have culture and like yep. I said, not just stand up, but music, everything. I think there's going to be potentially a really great renaissance of this country, like mm. on, on a cultural level. From COVID. From COVID. I mean, okay. it's one of those things that's, yeah. that's kind of coming out of this. Um, and thank God, because online we can't get along with each other. So we need to be meeting yes, in person. That. Yep. Yeah. That's yep. the, that's the good stuff, and that's what's going to save us. Yes, totally agree. Are you going to do you plan to do some stand up on the uh, van trip? Oh yeah. So the plan is like normally when I would travel, it's all like I book everything and make sure I have the itinerary. Yeah. I want to live really spontaneously okay. right now and just let myself have that. But it's not that hard for me to do certain kinds of shows, like not necessarily like working at clubs. Like okay, you know, I'm not going to be able to headline last minute <laughs> at right. some clubs, but. Um, I could you reach out to contacts or, or friends of contacts. Like, I, you know, I've been doing it long enough that I kind of have okay. a network around and I can say, hey, do you like have a show that you could put me on? Do you can you do a show in your garage that I can headline? And ah, OK, like, with like like neighbors and friends coming over, like 20, 30 people type of thing or uh, it could be that. I mean, anything it ranges from, you know, 30 people in someone's garage to someone knows how to throw one of these outdoor shows. That's 150 people. To oh, OK, someone that has a, a weekly show that uh, maybe they've already got a headliner, but I can come on and do a, a spot and he'll give okay. me 25 bucks in dinner or something. You yeah. know, it, there, it, it ranges all over, yeah. but I've done a lot of that kind of stuff because I like being on the road. I've done a lot of stuff kind of like being out of my car and yeah. crashing with people. So this is just, if anything, it's just going to be better because now I'll have 
a bit. Exactly. <laughs> there, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. And do you, so you, do you just know people all over the place or like, how are you going to just go on this multi-month van adventure and know people somehow? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. a ton of people. Yeah, yeah. How's this going to work? <laughs> I mean, the COVID thing makes it a little <laughs> bit more difficult, but, um, but no, I mean, we do have some, some friends and family uh, okay. scattered throughout the country, um, between the two of us. And then also, yeah, I mean, when stand up has given me a community that is similar, like I, I, analogous, I would say, to because I was raised Mormon. And okay. so if you're a Mormon, then if you show up anywhere, I mean, there's a there's a ward there and you could contact someone and you could have someone to stay, even if you didn't know oh, anybody. Really? Right. Oh, oh, OK. Totally. I saw the Mennonites are. I grew up Mennonite. Yeah. yeah. I mean, any of these like religions that are. um you know, that ask a lot of you, that have you meeting all the yeah. time. You're creating a fraternity as well as just some kind of, you know, yep. um, like we believe in this. Like when you believe in this stuff together, it allows you to, to bind together. But yeah. also when you're not only meeting like, OK, so the Protestants, the wimpy ones who are meeting once a week for yeah. one hour. And then afterwards, it's like, oh, the coffee and donuts is kind of all you. You might have a few minutes chatting, yeah. maybe twice a year you do a charitable event, whatever. Like that's not. No. So then you can't just like call them a method in Arkansas. Right. Okay. But if you guys all have a lot of shared values, a lot of shared experiences and so on, like that, yeah, there's, there's a real network. Well, the same mm-hmm. is true for stand up, And especially mm. if you're any good, if you've been kind to people at all, um, if you've, if you've traveled around, if you've helped people when they were traveling around, I have a spreadsheet of, of like people, whether I've met them once or a few times and I try to keep notes about it. And, but so oh, yeah? you, you, you're that you, deliberate about that. Oh yeah. I've oh, been, I've been cool. keeping that for years. Other, other stand ups or just friends that or people Both. you meet in general? Both. I mean, it could be, yeah, a lot of other stand-ups. I have a section for stand-ups and a section for non-stand-ups. And, and, okay. and it's like, so yeah, it might be someone I met after a show who, and because there's people who are comedy fans. You know, they might not yeah. be stand-up, but they're like in the comedy world. And they, they're like, oh, comics love, like I have a big place and comics crash here all the time. And I would love if you're ever coming through again, I can help hook you up with a producer of a show and then I'll, oh, uh, wow. you know, that kind of stuff. And I just, I'm like, great, <laughs> writing that down in my database. Uh, okay. Which is like the other day on Instagram, I posted something about van life. And people were like, oh, when are you coming to this state? When are you coming here? Oh, I, okay. know, I don't know who the fuck these people are. That's right. I, but I'm like writing them in my, I'm like, okay, look up Mellow you know, on Instagram yeah. and when I go to Michigan. And I'm going to, you know, <laughs> and she's cute, by the way. So we're going to keep note of that. All right. Okay. You are polyamorous as well, mm-hmm. correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. So that doesn't bother Casey at all? What? The polyamorous thing. Why would she bother her? She's poly too. I mean, oh, okay. we, we met when we're, we're both poly. Yeah. Okay. So um, everyone was everyone was up front with that on the on the on the get go. Yeah, I mean, in the gay world, like not everybody is poly now, but at least okay. So when I got my my most recent divorce, um, when we were separated, like I knew at that point, I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna be poly now. You know, like okay. I, I don't know that I want to get into another relationship where we're like not being so I just yep. started you know introducing myself or talking to people you know we would you would meet someone or you put it on your tinder profile for one okay. thing and then um or just when you meet someone out at a show I mean you know it's just kind of like you're starting to flirt and start and telling each other a little bit about yourselves and you're like oh and I'm Polly right oh of okay. course I'm Polly too you okay. know <laughs> There's a lot of that. I, I, not everybody is. Yeah. Um, sometimes you meet people and they say they kind of are or cool with it. And then, you know, in a couple of weeks, they're texting you and being like, oh, I have a boyfriend now. And okay. he whatever. And I'm like, OK, we went on one date. Like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, fine. That's what it is. Yeah. But but yeah. So that's my experience with it. And, and I mean, it, I think when people hear Polly, sometimes they think that that means that like. Uh, she and I, or one of us, or whatever, is just like fucking somebody every night. Sorry, I don't know. Can we curse on your it's okay. oh, Christian? Yeah. Part? Okay. Um, and, I'm but not it's, gonna stop you. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's You're like a grown adult. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I don't. You know what yeah. people want to hear. Um, so well, the podcast app has a little e thing you can put by it, and then we're good. Okay. So. But yeah, so it's it's like it, for more for us um, when we met, we just we first of all just didn't want to be getting into something where we're now like imposing rules on each other or right. that's kind of a weird aspect of monogamy. And then also, and you just want to be open to the possibility of love for one thing because uh, falling in love a new t- another you know you, do you want to never fall in love again? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like it's kind of crazy. And then or if and so then. It, some people will fall in love, but then they're just like, oh, they don't do anything about it. Well, you're going to have an emotional affair or whatever. Instead, it could just be like, well, I hope Casey falls in love with more people. I want to fall in love with more people. Mm. I hope we fall in love with some of the same people. One of the great yep. things about lesbian polyamory is it's like, yeah, just more boobs, dude. I mean, like we threesomes are my, I'm like, I'm not really uh, like, 
oh, I want to go find women by myself. Like, that's fine if she's not interested in someone and I am, you know, like maybe I have a little bit more of a sex drive, you know. Um, sure, but I'm still like not that. Like, I would much rather us find someone that we both like. Yeah. You know, that's that's my favorite scenario. Okay. So, so like that is... All right, so you are you you tell her you're polyamorous and you don't have a problem. If, I'm sorry, is it Casey or Kelsey? Casey. Casey. All right, if Casey finds falls in love with someone else, there's no. Is there a part of you though where it's like you know when you're you're kind of I don't know by yourself or you're thinking or you're going to sleep or whatever and you're like ah like is there a part of you where that bothers you or does um, it just not bother you? I think, I mean, I don't know how it, because we've only been together two years, you know, so I don't know how the ebbs and flows of things are going to be. But right now, um, I've never watched her actually like fall in love with someone in Mm. that kind of deep way. We've, I mean, definitely have like feelings for people and Mm -hmm. and whatnot. But I mean, neither of us has been like head over heels with anyone. So for one, I just can't answer that yet. I see. Um, But for another thing, I think, you know, you definitely requires communication and, uh, you know, and, but we, she and I are so honest with each other. Mm-hmm. We really communicate and we really talk th- everything through. And I think for the most part, like I would, I would lo- kind of, I mean, I could, it could wind up being harder for me than I think, but I think I would really love for her to fall in love with someone because it's so, it's, they call it compersion, right? You get happy when you get happy for your partner when they're in that state. Because mm-hmm. when you're in love, okay, you have all this energy, you're so ha- much happier, you have all the yeah. sex drive, whatever. And I just feel like that's just going to spill over to me. Like, the, 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 what makes me the happiest is watching Casey be happy. Right. You know, so just like I love watching her play soccer. I mean, it's like, or, you know, again, when we're having threesomes, like I love watching her make love with another woman. Like it's the best. And especially, you know, in sex, you're, you're, you're kind of preoccupied sometimes. You don't even get to watch someone come fully. You, you, it's nice to watch them. It's nice mm-hmm. to watch them get to do stuff. Because normally if they're doing stuff to you, you can't really fully watch them. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like all of that, like it's, it's, it's really great stuff. So I would like to think, and, and it, it would be, I think the hardest thing would be if she felt like, in love with someone where I was like, I did not like this person, <laughs> you okay, know, yeah. that would be probably <laughs> hard and weird. Right. I think we have a uh, good taste in this relationship, but you know, have you, it. have you always been like open to being polyamorous or is that a new thing for you? Yeah, no, I haven't been. Um, I remember when, in my, you know, in my youth and my, when I was, well, okay. So first of all, I was raised Mormon. And yeah, we need to hear about that at some point. Then we can come back to that. <laughs> well, <laughs> just for just for that if purposes of this, um, you know, they don't really tell you about the blameless history of the church. And then at some point, when you're in you know, a nine, ten, eleven, twelve, there, at some point, you kind of realize like, oh, okay. We used to be polygamous. And then they're like, well, yes, but also we had to change the laws because of the U.S. laws. Um, but the reality is we believe in polygamy after death because um, a man. So, you, you know, you get sealed in the Mormon temple for time and all eternity versus okay. this puny to death do us part thing. Um, so there a man could get sealed to a woman. She dies and then if he remarries and, and another worthy Mormon woman and they get sealed in the temple, he could get sealed eternally to her forever. And so then to, to, when, to the, the, the wife that died to the second one, to another wife. Oh, okay. So then now he would be spiritually married to those two women. And this could happen. I mean, he could keep having strings oh, okay. of wives die and remarry and reseal. And then he could have three or four wives. And so then in the afterlife, they believe, you know, that. Um, then the dude would have several wives. Okay. I thought the Mormon church was still polygamous, though, like in this life. Is that uh, not really a thing not, anymore? Not the official Mormon church. You will get excommunicated oh. from the from the official Latter-day Saint church, but oh, there are sorry. offshoots, of course, like there's some fundamentalist um, people in Arizona and in Mexico and stuff mm. where they are polygamous. But they'll even um, excommunicate you if you're like in Africa. It's kind of fucked up because in Africa, you know, where, where some people are uh, polygamous, if you want to join the Mormon church, they'll make you dismiss your other wives <laughs> which is crazy because but I mean it's just like a PR thing I'm not sure they just wanted a consistency what, what I, do you mean dismiss your other wives like if you were married and then you decided to marry another wife no or, like if you were converted to Mormonism after you already had three wives um because oh. you, you know you oh, live in some country where that's that's a norm okay um they will make t- you get rid of all but one yeah oh I see okay so. when did that change because I I don't know a lot about the Mormons 1890 but, 
Oh, so that changed a long, long time ago. Mm-hmm. But they still well, had to phase it out at that point because a lot of people were polygamous, polygamously married. Okay. So it did take a few generations for them to be kind of... But they've gotten to the point by the, I don't know, 30s or 40s or something, they got to the point where it was like, no, you really can't do this anymore. And, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, then what, what what's going on with some of those Netflix documentaries that shows like this big Mormon family in like Salt Lake City and he's got like five wives. Like I've seen some of that. Uh, Is that not like, that's not probably, traditional Mormons. Right. They're probably that. some kind of fundamentalist sect. I don't oh, even know what all TV okay. shows are anymore. I tried right. to watch Big Love for a while, but it, it's so fantastical and just, it's not, it's not like the church that I was in, you know, like it's, okay. it's just very different. Um, so, but so yeah, they, once I kind of learned that, I was incensed as a as a kid because monogamy had been given to me. I mean, I watched the Disney movies and read the book. And like monogamy mm-hmm. is held upheld as this like thing, and I felt very possessive and jealous over my hypothetical future husband, even though I'm gay. You know, like so mm-hmm. that's how strong that 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 is that cultural programming that I was like mad at. And and it took me a few years, I'm, but until I remember in my junior year of high school because we go to hour long seminary. Um, Every day before, uh, every day before school, we go to our like scripture study. And in junior year, we were going over what they call the Doctrine of Covenants and Pearl of Great Price, like the Mormon extra like scriptures, extra revelations. Um, and we were talking about polygamy, and I asked uh, my teacher about it. I was like, because 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 for me, I was realizing at that point, I was like, I'm gay. You know, I didn't I wasn't out at church, but um, then I thought like, well, okay, so. Maybe I'll get married to a dude and I'll, I'll tell him and everything. I'm like, oh, look, I'm a lesbian, but obviously I care about going to the celestial kingdom for eternity. And okay. so um, why don't we, you know, do this? And then in the afterlife, we'll pick out how it checks together. Okay. And, you know, so then I, so at that point I, I realized, like, and I, like I said, I tried to ask something about it in seminary and my poor dude teacher was like, uh, I don't know what the relationship is in the afterlife between sister wives. They're yeah. all, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, but, uh, that was kind of my idea was that like, okay, well this is nice. I'll get to marry women in the eternity and I don't know what it's like in heaven. Like, do, you know, cause the, the idea here on earth would have been like the dudes having sex with the women separately. And I'm like, well, can they all share the same bed? Mm. What can we have threesomes? Like, mm-hmm. for, you know, I don't, you know, well, well I'll ask about the two, the women just doing stuff together later, but how about a threesome? Like where can we meet here? Um, yeah, but then how old are you at this point when you're having these questions, like when you're asking these people this stuff, the, the gay polygamy stuff, that's like 16. I was like 16 and I'm okay. being a little bit. <laughs> are a, you talking to your parents about that? Like, are you asking your parents those questions or are you keeping that oh, kind of to yourself? I mean, I would ask them about polygamy and like, I, you know, my mother hated polygamy too. That okay. made her, um, just, yeah, in the sense that, that like this was going on and she hated that so, so many Mormon women believed that, that polygamy was a celestial way. She didn't really think it was, but she was already starting to become kind of a cafeteria Mormon, if you will, you know, an mm-hmm. a la carte Mormon. She was getting a, negotiating her, her way with the church. Okay. Um, but, but yeah, so then when I went to college, I pretty quickly stopped going to church, started reading more books and got to the point where I was like, mm, this is a human invention. And I can, I went from being, believing it was true to worrying that it was true. And this is my eternity at stake to just being like, okay, this is, I can see this is a human, what it was, you know, this stuff is not, um, the truth with some capital T's. And so at that point I went back and I, to, you know, not that I, this was all like a conversation in my head together, but in terms of polyamory, that wasn't even a word yet. You know, like in oh, okay. my yeah. worldview, there were, there were people who had open relationships. I'd seen swingers on TV a little bit on a thing, you know, um, but there was starting to be through college and getting kind of getting into the gay community, if you will. Um, and in the gay culture, like there was starting to be a little bit of talk. I went to college, like this is 2004 to 2008. There's a little bit of talk about poly as an option. Okay. Um, but it wasn't huge. And, and I, at the time, you know, and I always had like intense crushes on girls and like just, you know, wanted them, you mm-hmm. know. And like, so the idea of like sharing and like, you know, no, I wanted to be codependently, you know, me and you forever. And we see each other, you know, we're mm-hmm. soulmates and we're, you know. Um, so I remember even like the, the woman who would later become my second wife and, and now second ex-wife, uh, had a huge crush on her and we, and we a little bit dated years, years and years ago before all of this. And 
you know, I remember asking her about it and kind of exploring those ideas of like, would you ever be And the fact that she was a little bit into the idea of maybe being Polly was like for me, you know, and good. What's good. You're saying. <laughs> No, it was, or, like, was like, oh, gosh, oh, back oh, then I don't you know. Didn't like that. No, yeah, I didn't oh, like I that. See. I was okay, like, I it. was very, I, I considered myself very, like, jealous and possessive. I and, see, okay. Um, so, but when I, with my first ex wife, when we were, like, get in this kind of separation time, um, I tried to, I had, I had read Sex at Dawn fairly recently. Have you read that? I have not. Um, it's a really kind of like one of the most famous books that, you set off a lot of people being like, "Oh, let's look into being Polly." Then, oh, really? Right. Okay. Yeah, Sex at Dawn. How how new is it? Not very. I mean, it must have okay. come out uh, before. I mean, it has to have been two thousand eight at the okay. latest. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so that book really kind of goes through a lot of evidence historically, you know, from so from previous civilizations and other cultures that still exist that are different than ours. That how it looks like. Yeah, most of our ancestors were probably poly. Most, you know, this this idea of like long term monogamy, um, one and one, it that that wasn't ever really a thing. That's not how we evolved. So this is something that we're like imposing um, on humanity, and it ma- makes compelling cases. And so I started to read that book to my first ex wife because the woman who later became my second ex wife and I had just told each other about our feelings for each other, <laughs> and I was trying to get her to be, what if we could all be together? Right. And so <laughs> that did not go over well. I made it about okay. three pages into Sex at Dawn before she's like, what the fuck is this book? Okay. I see what you're doing. No. Uh-huh. So whatever. Um, and then I got with, so I, I immediately was with my first ex-wife and then got with my, you know, the next, the next one. And there was no like time for me to kind of like date or explore myself or anything. And I knew I kind of needed that, but I didn't, it just, I didn't want to give up my chance to be with Katie. And... So when we got together, I know we probably didn't even really talk about it, but, you know, there might have been some times we kind of had a little bit of a conversation of like, oh, maybe one day in the future it's po-. But, you know, we never really went there, I guess. But I started uh, once she was leaving me uh, and I, I even had some thoughts in my head, like, I wonder if maybe one day in the future we might explore this, but like after, well, let's just be together for six or seven years. Once we get to a point, maybe we'll get to a point where we're so solid and we trust each other so much. And maybe we're a little bit bored and ready for something, you know, whatever, yeah. maybe it'll, um, but then once she was leaving me, I mean, I really fought it and it was devastating for me and I was crying for weeks, but then finally there started to be a thing in my head of like, you know what, this might be, maybe we really weren't that compatible in certain ways. I really want to date a lot of people and have mm-hmm. a lot of experiences. And I think I want to be Polly. And so we, um, when we separated, you know, like I just went out the gate being like, okay, like I, yeah, I don't want to, I've tried this thing a couple of times of like, let's own each other. Let's okay. be codependent. Yep. Let's, and it's funny now because Katie, my, my most recent ex-wife, uh, one of the things that she said to me, and I don't know if she would stick by this was like, uh, in terms of all these identities that people have nowadays, she's like, well, the one thing I know I am is monogamous. <laughs> oh, really? Like, okay, okay. Well. she said that like more recent or back when you were still married? Um, just a few months after we separated, kind oh, of okay. in that time. Okay. So I don't so know. So she kind of had that clarity. Did she have that clarity for the first time or she was just then kind of willing to really express that clarity? I think she had that clarity for the first time. Cause like I said, oh, okay. I mean, early in, early in our knowing each other, she had given yeah. some kind of like maybe answers and and whatnot. And we'd never really like like had a kind of a firm no on that conversation. Yeah. But now she was like, I think she watched me. I, you know, I'm not sure she saw me doing it and she was just like, no, okay. I think I'm just traditional and I don't want one of these newfangled arrangements. Okay. I just want to have a wife and just, yeah. yeah. So but, are you open to, it sounded like it was Katie. Like, are you open to Katie having a monogamous lifestyle? And if that's her thing and that's what works for her and that's what she wants to do, like, are you open to that being the right answer for her? Oh, yeah. Okay. I think, um, you know, especially for lesbians, <laughs> they might be the only people that monogamy makes sense for. No, I don't know. That's probably even less true. Uh, I, Different people, but don't you think it could be more true? Like, I mean, I don't know, yes and no. I mean, I think it depends on the person because there are some yeah. people who 
you know, maybe have, maybe you have a low sex drive or maybe you are just, you don't crave novelty as much as other people or whatever. I think these are all spectrums from people. So totally, you know, it could be totally possible that some people really are happiest with monogamy. And yes, maybe if not, if not for the lesbians because of women's temperaments, I mean, my, my big issue with monogamy as a societal norm, like it's one thing if some people do it, but for it to be the societal norm and default, it's like, Mm, well, now what we're saying is that that basically means because the population is 50 50 that one each man gets one woman. Get, mm -hmm. And it's like, well, most men are unfuckable. Most mm -hmm. men are supposed to die childless. That's what evolution is. Mm -hmm. We're not allowing evolution to happen if we're sitting there going, oh, the church has decreed every man gets a woman like no, 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 no. Some men are supposed to be winners and a lot of them are supposed to be losers. Mm -hmm. You know, some men should, the, the good ones, I think, should have more mates. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what, mm -hmm. whether we're doing marriage in some kind of, you know, state-sanctioned paperwork kind of way or whatever. But it should be that, you know, a lot of women, you know, a lot of times we just like hanging out with each other. Should be a lot of lesbianism. Even women who, you know, are historically straight girls, as I would call them, or, you know, are kind of buy whatever there's a lot of lesbianism for everybody to be enjoying mm -hmm. and then you know there could be some amount of like either dudes who like visit sometimes and we're all happy to oh good you mow the lawn and we'll have sex with you and oh thanks for the meat and leave yeah. you know or marriages where it's like there's you know six chicks and a dude or something but instead of it being like one man has several wives yeah several women having zero to two men sounds better to me or just i mean i say it that way to be cute like mm -hmm. the having you know but it's like we're collectively working together and there's no patriarch arm hey arm the guy i own you and you're and right. mine yeah. no 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 there's just people who and i mean i i know some of these relationships now i have some friends who are living on nice little polyamorous situations where they are on a farm with some children and, and oh, several yeah? parents yeah okay yeah how were you, did you always like girls or like what age did you kind of realize that or acknowledge that um I, inwardly and outwardly right because it sounded yeah. like there was a time where you didn't kind of let the church know yeah no i mean i came out to people starting when i was 16 um almost 17 i started trickling out okay. coming out to Were you people. still part of the Mormon church at that point? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I still, I was still, uh, going to church all the way through the end of high school and then in the very beginning of college. Okay. Um, and yeah, I mean, I started having what I would call mommy crushes as young as like five, um, four or five. And then at puberty, I started having intense crushes on, on girls, usually, you know, maybe a little bit older than me at the time, you know, I'm 11, they're 17 and then I'm 12 and they're 14 or something, you know? Um, and then it's, as I got a little older, it started evening out to my age, you know, so I okay. kind of watched that and I'm, by the time I was... 13 it was definitely like i was praying to god being like hey um could you make me like half as attracted to men as i am to women i could work with that but mm. right now i got nothing for dudes and mm. i am in love with these women mm -hmm. so let me just fast and pray and read some extra scriptures <laughs> well it didn't really work so so you like you prayed for that to change or you hope that that would change oh yeah because you knew i was a mormon Oh, uh, okay. And by the way, is Mormons not, not, they're not open to like a gay lifestyle at all? No. Not at all? No, okay. I mean, you could, um, you could struggle with same sex attraction and not, you know, have sex yeah. with people right. or have relationships or whatever and still be in the church. You could, you could be in the church and like not, you know, participate, go to the temple. You know, you could, you could have, you could be gay married, right? And just be like, well, I'm going to go to Mormon church and still, and you could choose to pay tithing. You could choose, right. but you wouldn't get a calling. You, okay. they would kind of look at you weird if they saw you taking the sacrament next to your wife. Okay. Uh, you know. And what's the calling? I have heard this before. Oh, just that all, all people in the, in the church get some kind of lay calling, whether it's to be the bishop of that ward. I mean, I know I'm using Mormon lingo, just people mm -hmm. can, um, or it's to be the clerk or it's to teach the kids in the seminary classes or then the little, uh, little kid classes or to lead the music or whatever it is. I see. Okay. So it's not always like a vocational calling, like you're an attorney or you're It's not. No, it's never that. It's some kind of church position okay gotcha um th they do hire actual attorneys and pr right. people and, yeah okay know. and where did you grow up where where are you at this point when you're a child in houston in houston texas mm -hmm. oh okay is there a big mormon community in houston yeah uh there's a big mormon community just about everywhere honestly oh, yeah? but houston it's you know any big city is going to have plenty of mormons um okay. texas has probably a little bit more than 
our fair share, I guess. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then when did you wind up in Austin? Uh, I moved here January of 2015. Okay. And what brought you here? Well, I was living in Boston at the time when I was with my first ex, the woman who became my first ex-wife. Um, so I left her and came to um, I, to be with my girl, uh, the, the girl Katie. I would later marry. She lived in Dallas, and we looked for a city where we could both do what we wanted to do. She wanted to get into farming, like sustainable, you know, healing the earth farming practices, and I wanted to do stand up. You know, I was okay. I had finally started doing stand up, and so Austin had a great burgeoning comedy scene. And, um, and people here care about farming and good food and everything. Yep. So yeah, we, we chose here to, to be together. Okay. And you like Austin? This is good. I mean, you're about to go out traveling, but, uh, I mean, Austin's, it's, oh, I love Austin. yeah, there's a lot I of mean, good things going yeah. for it. I was, you know, it's, I visited a lot and I knew that was like one of my great options as someone from Houston is like that Austin would be a good city I would like, but yeah. at the same time I wanted to go explore um, some other things. And I had lived in Dallas and then I lived in Orlando and then New York and then Boston and, I've been Austin and and I love it, but I am itching to go, you know, do some traveling. So hence the lifestyle. Yes, and the stand up comedy is this something you always wanted to do, or is this something that has been more recent? How did you get into that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I discovered stand up when I was sixteen or seventeen, like through Yahoo Music, R.I.P. Um, and then. Uh, you know, had some, but I mean, I had never heard of an open mic or anything at that point. Okay. You know, I just kind of fell in love, and I kind of thought, I wonder one day. And so when I was 23 and I was in Orlando, um, I realized like, I'm about to move to New York and like, what if, cause I had thought I'd been thinking like I should be a writer. And I was like, what if I should do stand up? And I did go to an open mic a couple of times there and killed it because everyone else sucked ass. So it was oh, not, yeah? not hard. You to, did good yeah. like right out of the gate. Oh yeah. Because I'm, really? I'm a writerly kind of person. So okay. I, that's the thing. I wrote a whole thing and, and were edited it and practiced it oh, in front of okay. people and got, no, yeah. you know, I was like so over prepared that it, you know, was bound to go pretty well, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, I did that. And then like one oh, mic in Dallas, just c- between moving and then in New York, I took my time. I like went and watched one and then I went and did one. And it was a miserable experience because um, of how things were back then that got a lot better. And then I just quit for four and a half years. And it wasn't until I was in Boston that um, I had a friend who took a class and my other friend taught the class and it had, it was just like, God, I feel like Jonah, um, that like had my destiny of what I was supposed to do. Mm. And I was running away from it for years. And it was just, it, and it was made so easy for me. I literally lived above this guy who taught these classes, who ran an open mic and several shows, who was so encouraging to me, like start, I, I made, started making friends with standups in the, oh, cause wow. we would Is have apartment parties. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then finally it wasn't until my, my doofus friend, I mean, in a good way, I love him, but like who was taking this, he was taking, I, I ran into him at the Boston comedy festival. He was like ushering and I was like, Oh, what do you know about the comedy world? And he's like, Oh, I'm a comedian now. I took this class and I'm doing, and I'm like, Oh my God, this friend of mine is doing it. Like how can I can't not do it anymore? This is yeah. like, I, that's my thing. You know? Okay. So I, yeah, I started taking a class myself to force myself to do it. And then just, you start going to open mics. And How often do you, have you bombed? Like it's, so my understanding, I thought that every stand up just bombs for a long time and finally they start to like gain some traction, but yeah. you kind of killed out of the gate. So yeah, no, I mean, at different comics, some comics are, um, I, I, there's usually, there's broadly two kinds of comics, ones who, um, need to or like me where you're writerly, but you've got a lot of stage fright. You got to learn how to, um, have stage presence. Do you and have the, stage fright? I, um, Still do? not anymore. Okay. Really did though. Oh yeah. I mean, I would like okay. poop five times a day, just knowing I was going to do two minutes on That'd a stage. Be totally <laughs> me for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, I, and again, I was so scripted back then. And so then I'm just like all day long, just going, just like sub vocalizing my routine and like okay. whatever. It's like, it's what, you know, just not really how you're supposed to do it, but, yep. um, it's what you try to do when you're, you know, trying to control things. Right. Um, and so, and then there's some people who have the stage presence, but need to learn how to write a joke, right. you know? So the people who need to learn how to write a joke are, you know, they're going to do a lot of bombing. They're probably going to do a lot of drinking and get up there and just, you know, try things out and they have to throw their shit at the wall until they figure their stuff out. Yep. And then those of us who are writerly, like we have to get up there and, and get all our stage time in until we, until you just get to the point where your adrenaline isn't like jacking you up that much, you know, okay. you yep. want, you want some, but not too much. You yep. have to just get comfortable there and not be like kind of on the ropes, I yep. guess. 
Um, yeah. So now if anything, sometimes right before I'm going on stage, like I just realize like I'm numb. I gotta, I need to do some push ups to get myself to feel, you know, like I need to get a little high or I gotta do some push ups or something. Cause I'm feeling nothing and I need a little bit of adrenaline. Like the, you're feeling nothing because it's your body's reaction to sort of, it's the, the butterflies or it's just like that. Ah, this is nothing. This no. is every day. The butterflies this are is, a good it, sign. Like when you have the butterflies, you know, like then you've got this adrenaline, you're thinking, I'm like watching the comic before me and going, okay, what am I going to okay. say about what's going on here? Like you're, you know, okay. you're like aware. But when, when I'm feeling nothing, it's like this show, there's, no stakes and it's just fine or i'm just like you know i just have this like i can't get you know you kind of got to get it up for this yeah it's it's like yeah so that's the thing if you're if when i'm not feeling the butterflies that's when i really get like "Mm, i don't want to be dead inside right now let's oh i see let's get something to be excited about ariel and you've only gotten to that point because you've done it so often yeah so often and so for and for so long and i see but yeah so i didn't bomb i mean i i've probably could count the times I've it depends on what you mean by bomb too like there's sets where you know there's a fine amount of laughter I guess but it didn't re- meet my standards and that okay. feels like a bomb you know yeah. or I wasn't present or yeah. I said something the one thing that's going to make me feel like or it, it ended a little weird or something right. like those then become what you ha- what you feel like are bombs whereas when you're talking about people who just like alienate the audience and it is awkward or there's crickets. Yeah, what is that? Because comedians have talked about that and what are they talking about? Like no one laughs at a particular joke or no one laughs the entire time or you can just tell there's this disconnect between the comedian and the audience. Like what? Yeah. what is that? So How bad can this get? It can get pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, it's almost worse if you get up there and like it's just really, really bad, but it's not even funny how bad it is, and it's just boring, and people are just kind of mm. like, huh, and, or people just aren't paying attention. They're gonna go talk to themselves or something. Like uh, that's that's one okay. kind of bombing, and we just can't get their attention, and and there's not even when they are paying attention, they're like, we don't like you or your jokes. Um, but then there's also the kind where the audience hates you. I mean, where okay. where you. Um, and sometimes you might, it might even be going well, but if you say something weird and wrong suddenly, I mean, it, it can get bad. It can get bad fast. And if you don't yeah. know how to recover or, you know, like, yeah. um, and those are those moments when people have famously like started in on the N word or something weird where okay. if you say something <laughs> where, where you meant it one way or you thought they would be with you, but you, but you knew you were kind of going for, okay. You know, when you're playing like a uh, ping pong or some kind of a tennis or whatever where you try to like really you're gonna yeah. go for it and like hit that yep. ball and it's gonna just if yep. you nail it awesome yes but when you flub it you know uh, okay. then, and then the audience yeah. gets like uncomfortable for you and weird and then oh. you and then now your adrenaline's really going and you're okay. like you're like Ooh, and you're sweating and you're in this place so i think sometimes when you say the wrong thing then a comic will have this impulse to double down because they're going, no, you didn't get that I was being horrible to be funny. Like, no, I didn't mean that, you know? And so then they might say something even more horrible to try to be like, no, you get it. Like, and then sometimes that'll work every now and then. It's a real Hail Mary. Yeah. Because every now and then, like really doubling down on awfulness will work because then you can kind of, but sometimes, and then it winds up with the the headlines or, you know, yeah, like, oh. I heard uh, Joe Rogan on one of his podcasts. I don't know when the podcast came out, but I was listening to it, I think last week. He said, Oh no! It was with the Whole Foods guy that he had on recently, the CEO oh, yeah, of Whole Foods. And the, uh, this, yeah, I haven't listened to much of it yet, but it was pretty decent so far. And he was trying, he was explaining to the founder and CEO of Whole Foods what bombing is like as a stand-up comic, and he said it's like sucking a thousand dicks in front of your mom. Um, I mean, I could say, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know about <laughs> either. Maybe for experience. some people, no. it wouldn't um, be a problem, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> from what I know for, of for Joe, me. he's a straight male, and that would be an issue. So. Uh, I think that I would much rather bomb than suck a thousand dicks, <laughs> even if my mom's not there. Um, yeah, one dick in front of my mom or a thousand. I'm still going to take the bomb. I mean, <laughs> but you have like bombed I before. It. I have bombed before. Um, but not, I, I have a pretty good batting average. I'll just okay. say, oh, but yeah? that's partly because I'm, you know, because in the beginning when I would have, should have been bombing a million times, I was so prepared, but there's okay. a blessing and a curse to that because then it meant I didn't like when comics talk about like just bombing and like, it's almost like when you have a near death experience or you almost die of cancer or something. And then that like frees you to just live mm-hmm. some good bombs can really get you to the point where you're like fearless about audiences. Uh, yeah, Cause you've, it, it's already been worse.
worse than yes. whatever this is. Um, I like to give myself small doses of that. I don't, I don't like to okay. jump all the way off the cliff. Yep. You know, I like to like slowly build it up. Yep. Um, so it, you, I think you can grow faster and better if you just let yourself get in there and be vulnerable and like take chances. Yeah. That's probably for the best. But, uh, I was very controlled and I didn't want to fail in front of anybody. Okay. I wanted to, I wanted, you know, to impress everyone. Yep. And so I was um, pretty prepared, but I've definitely had some times where, it was like, whoo, okay. okay. Oh, I'm not going to sleep well tonight. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like on a particular joke or just the whole set kind of felt yeah, usually, that way? I mean, if it's one joke, you can usually, you know, recover or, okay. or something. Um, but it'll be like the whole set. Or usually for me, it would be like, it might have started okay, but then got then toward the okay. end, it starts getting bad. Yeah. Yep. Or you say something. Or, you know, I just say something and I can never get the audience kind of back after that. Right. Or yeah. you start off oh, and man. you think your, your riff that you're going to start off with with is going to be good. You know, you have something to say about the last guy, but it just falls flat. And then okay. you never quite get the audience right. from there because you can never, they, now they're confused about who you are and how to feel and like all your yes. other jokes aren't working. Yeah. I just have such respect for the craft because I, I think it could be for me, if I would try it, it would be terrifying, but if it would work, it would be like so exhilarating. What's yeah. your build up? What's your build up routine? Like you mentioned some push ups. you mentioned getting high. Like, do you have, are you always super high when you're doing this or a little bit? Or no. like, do you have like the hour before, like, do you have things you do the same every time kind of leading up to your set? No, I mean, I don't, I mean, I, I had a phase of getting high before every set. Now it just more like if I, f I just play by ear. I prefer to be sober when I'm doing stand up. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I prefer to be sober. I don't really like to drink or anything. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I just want to be sharp and, okay. and even a little bit of alcohol can really just, if, if there's one word that doesn't come to my brain because yes. I had alcohol, like that's yes. not worth it up to half a beer, you know, can it, sometimes I know my mood and I'm like, you know what? I actually need a little bit of beer right now. Okay. I just need a tiny bit of inhibition listening. Mm -hmm. You know, I need a tiny bit of looseness. Um, or there might be, yeah, like I said, there might be times where I need to get a little high just cause I'm like, I don't, you know, like I want to be excited about doing mm -hmm. this. And if the stakes are low or if my material's old or something, you know, I'm like, you know, let me get, that kind of thing. But, but usually I want to be sober just because it's like, yeah, I want to be clear and I want to remember everything. I want my mind and my body, you know, my mind body system to remember all the lessons it's learning from yeah. this. Um, I don't want to be numb to any of that. Uh, yeah, I, I prefer to, yeah. And then after the show, let's all smoke a joint together, you know? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you don't smoke a lot though before because even pot will kind of make you sometimes kind of forget that one word or no, not as much forgetful. It's just more like, you know, it's that Russian roulette with pot where it could make you a little bit brilliant and like insightful and say that these things in the moment, or you could get just a little bit too much dopamine for everything you're putting right. together and you, you're connecting a little bit too much and, and yeah. maybe you get ahead of the audience and you, you might even think that you're having like a lot of fun. You might be having a lot of fun, but you listen back later and are like, Hmm. The audience wasn't quite as with me as I thought they okay. were or something like that. <laughs> it can go either way, but sometimes I get high and it's just brilliant, you know, yeah. and, it, and it really is just like, this is what I dreamed of is like, I just want to get high and go talk to people on the microphone. Like, yep. and I mean, it is, sometimes you have to, because once, once you're years in and, and you're getting better at it, you, you do sometimes forget, you know, what, what you used to like fantasize about and that okay. you're like, Oh my God, I'm living my dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 Is, is that what you do like for a living? Stand up comedy? Oh, I do a lot of things for a living. Um, I get some of my money from stand up. I get some of my money from writing. I get some of my ah, money. Writing what? Um, just <laughs> whatever I want on, <laughs> uh, on the internet. I mean, okay. Um, yeah, you can, you can make money from like screenwriting or like writing blog type no, stuff. Or? I mean, I've also started doing, um, some sketches, some writing, some like working on other people's projects. Sometimes they'll okay. give me their script and I'll, um, be a consultant for it. I mean, it's okay. just kind of all over the place. You can also write on medium. You can put mm. out your stuff and get like some of their, um, some of their revenue, you can actually make pretty good money <laughs> just, and then it becomes like mailbox money that on medium on medium. Yeah. Oh, okay. you, yeah. Uh, there, and there's good stuff on there. I really like it because there's original thinkers. Like most of the stuff you find online and you're looking for stuff. Everyone sounds like a computer, you know, they're copy uh, right. pasting stuff. No one's adding. There's so little humanity. So yep. medium's pretty cool. Cause if you're going to look, just like see what people are thinking and what the idea, you know, there's a lot of stuff that links to other um, publications, but a lot of people, you know, posting their own stuff on there that, um, it's out, you know, we're uh, having some discussion. I didn't, yeah. I wasn't aware of that. Like, would you, do you write on a particular genre, like on medium? Hmm. I don't know much about, I medium. mean, it's just, I, you know, I'm writing 
like, I guess think pieces would be okay. right. the idea. Yeah. So I just, you know, wrote something recently about why I don't ask for pronouns or want you to ask for mine okay. um, or announce them or whatever. Mm-hmm. Right now I'm writing something about Elliot Page or newest trans boy them. Okay. You know, yep. do you know who Elliot Page is? I don't, sorry. Do you know who Ellen Page was? I'm sorry, I don't. The little nugget from Juno and X-Men and Inception and Hard Candy. No. Nothing. The Elliot Page, what, what is the, what's the story there though? Well, about a week ago, uh, he, they came out as he, they. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So yep. they came out as a lesbian in 2014. Um, uh, long awaitedly came out as lesbian. We'd all, after Juno, been like, okay, look at the flannel and the, you mm. know, cute little face. Like, oh, that's, that's a lesbian, right? Um, but there was pressure for them not to come out. And then now they, and then they, they finally did two years after Obama evolved. You know, it was okay. kind of like, I was like, you got a slow clap from me, Ellen, you know, at the time, Ellen. Um, and so now they're coming out as he, they, and it's just, I have a lot of thoughts about it. And a lot mm. of lesbians have a lot of thoughts about it, but they're not really rep- being represented because uh, you can't talk about that shit online or you'll get <laughs> just plowed under. Mm. Um, you have uh, a lot of thoughts about um, Elliot Page? Yeah. Going trans? Yeah. What are those thoughts? Well, I'm not going to tell you. You got to <laughs> subscribe to Medium. And, oh, okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So we can find you on Medium and get those thoughts there. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, are you going to come through Nashville at all with your van trip? Uh, I mean, sure. I haven't. Do you know where you're going, or are you just um, gonna? We, I mean, strike west and see where you're going. No, land? I mean, we we have we have some of it in the beginning. Nashville's not, you know, that section of the country isn't in the first um, phase of plans. We're gonna be doing a lot of stuff like in Utah, and New Mexico, Arizona. A lot of it's also based on her ultra marathon running stuff. So there's all these races, and then you know to to re- register for the races for free. We can volunteer at other races, oh, but that's just, okay. that's great. Cause then we can yeah. run, you know, so we're just going to like, um, go around based mostly on the kind of running schedule and then I'll oh, okay. figure out stand up. I can do there. We also are going to go to, um, the last remaining 15 lesbian bars in the country. We're going to try to go to every There's single everyone? one of those. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? 15? There's only 15 lesbian 15 bars. 15 lesbian bars yeah. in the country. Mm hmm. Hmm. And there were never that many, um, okay. but they've, they really struggle. And even the ones that we're calling lesbian bars, if they're surviving, it's because they're probably a lesbian bar like one night a week. And then the rest of the nights, they have some other kind of theme that welcomes people in. But oh, okay. to even have like a vaguely lesbian bar, it's pretty challenging these days. Okay. So there's, there's tons of gay bars, but they're yes. not specifically lesbian bars. Right. And so if I you go see. there, just gonna, it's mostly dudes, you know. And all okay. Gotcha. Like where would be one of the more famous lesbian bars? Um, like, what, what okay, so like the cubby hole, and so in, in New York City, there's one place called the Cubby Hole, where that's been like thought of as a lesbian bar for a long time. Even though there again, it's Tuesday nights or lesbian nights, and even then, you might be seventy five, twenty five lesbians to other. Mm. Um, and then most nights of the week, you know that you could go there, and even if it's only like twenty five percent lesbian at that point, that's still more than you can get in just about anywhere. Well, okay. Um, so that's the kind of thing that'll happen. I think Henrietta Hudson is still open. That's more like a nightclub. That's also in New York. The the Brooklyn one shut down years ago. I think well, Ginger's might still be there, but um, but so that's Boston doesn't have a single lesbian bar, and that's mm. Boston. I mean, that's a, one of the lesbian cub uh, clapples. But 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 they have like at least when I lived there, I don't know if it's still the same. It was like second Saturdays that the machine was lesbian night. Fourth Fridays at Milky Way are lesbian mm-hmm. night. Um, so that's the kind of thing that'll happen, and yeah. I see. Um, your podcast, Make America Get Along Again. Mm-hmm. How long have you been doing that and what kind of got you into that? Um, I like the title, by the way. Thanks. Yeah. So it's, you got to search for MAGA yeah. for anyone. Um, yeah. Two A's. <laughs> two A's. And yeah, so I don't think, I don't know if everybody realizes this who looks at the my logo for it too. So it's, you know, you see MAGA inlaid in like these stripy colors and it's like red, blue, white, red, blue. And that's really to mimic the uh, all those like trans or non-binary or pan gender fluid flux or gender fawn fairy flags. I don't know if you know, we have like 300 flags now and identities that if you go to gender wiki, you can check out. And and like some of them, it's like at the point of like, OK, one person clearly submitted this and they drew a flag uh, and that's fine. Okay. But some of them are on your iPhone and Instagram's like filters 
or what you know like there, you can find all these little i mean maybe yours doesn't have that and mine does you know it's also <laughs> possible seen, they're yeah. tailoring also i don't use filters that much so yeah I'm probably so, there and i haven't seen it i if they first came up at like some gay week some gay pride month i don't know we have so many months and weeks it feels like so i don't know which one it was but at some point they gave us like all the little filters that you could just put a little non-binary flag over your face or you could mm. put the lip pan gender one and so it's like it's, on the one hand they're kind of you know like we sh- no one should take them seriously or enough to even but on the other hand they're actually like becoming a thing you know they've become so yeah this is like but but the red blue and white um you know it's the american flag colors and this is something that i've been working on for a few months i um was wanting to start another podcast because i have a podcast called gender fluids that i do with someone else and so she has a lot of control and you know and it's just it's it's its own niche um Mm -hmm kind of audience there but I really want to do and I'm like on that podcast I'm funny some but I also am sincere a lot gender fluids or or make America get along again. both but especially okay. for MAGA okay yeah with MAGA it's like I don't want to have to be funny all the time right um is and that a I pressure a you sometimes say. feel like if you're a stand up yeah. comedian and well I mean on stage yes or yeah course. I mean and when people yeah. tell you to tell them a joke at a dinner party or whatever yeah um, does that happen oh, they're God. like oh you're a stand up comedian can you tell us a joke right now yeah constantly oh it's, but it's like isn't well, that a little abrasive like isn't that a little rude yeah a little bit? most people don't get asked to do their job when you tell them what they do for a living you know if you're a doctor or stand up though you will get asked you know like yeah. can you look at my mole can you tell me a joke like there's certain okay. jobs we do that and there's certain <laughs> jobs we don't yeah, and that, you yeah know. it's true we used to build sheds and no one at a dinner party was like, hey, can you throw me up a shed right now? It's like, that's just not a thing. Right, exactly. But I feel like if I was a stand-up comedian and I was at a dinner party and someone's like, hey, can you tell us a joke? It's not respecting the art, really. That's how I would right. feel. Right, I mean, it's you're like, also not respecting all the other people this. who put the work into this. Somebody uh, got a, a mic out there for me and put exactly. the lights up and we, we have the lights in a certain way. Or seat. I mean, it, it, you know, hopefully at the comedy show, some some shows are just at a bar and you're just on your own, whatever. Right. But if it's done well, I mean, a lot of people went into to, to creating this experience and so like, yeah, let's not slight them. But also it's like, dude, I'm probably going to be funny during this dinner party. Let me get comfortable and right. let's talk okay. and you'll just enjoy. Like, I'm not mm. usually, mm. my act isn't like 1920s vaudeville telling jokes anyway like yeah. i'm a more of an ob- you know, observant you know like uh, conversational yeah um so yeah just silly but anyway wait we were getting off the uh, MAGA we were thing. talking about maga and dinner party i think Tell you were telling joke. i think oh you being were, funny the pressure yeah. to be funny yes exactly right so on maga yeah well i mean on gender fluids i definitely i just don't want to veer too off uh far from being funny either because it's it's a just a funny podcast you mm-hmm. know um but with maga it's it's not that I, I don't even want the pressure to be funny it's just more that i have more to say and if i if we're going on tangents that aren't funny like that's fine you know in that context um i really do want to help make america get along again i mean it's it's what's embarrassing is how sincere i am about this um that's part of why you know, i like that it's called maga because i'm keeping people a little bit <laughs> guessing as to what's mm-hmm. even going on here um but if the truth is i just genuinely want to help this country which i feel like is falling apart mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> why is it embarrassing that you're so sincere about that because you don't think. Oh, people I'm would, just in the stand-up pe- world, I guess. You uh, don't know okay, what sure. sincerity yeah. is. Not okay. <laughs> it's not one of our right. favorite yeah. qualities. There, if people think you're sincere, then their perception is you're sincere as part of your shtick, or as part of the play, or it's part of the the, the scheme, and they wouldn't really believe or, that you would actually be sincere. No, about I mean, it. I think if anybody knows me at all, they'll they will see that I just am a sincere person. I mean, I mean, yeah. I think that's it's. I guess I could have. Uh, I mean, okay, I'm imagining Tim Dillon, whom I've met, but I'm not like friends with. Um, hearing about my podcast and just being like gay, <laughs> you know. Uh, okay, <laughs> I mean, sure. Uh, which is that almost hard to to have that feeling? Is that almost a difficult feeling to feel? What, that like some if, people if might judge me look at your for... podcast and be like, yeah, gay. Like you almost feel like a little bit passed passed over a little bit there. Well, I mean, like, sure. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. Like, I just wouldn't want to. Yeah, I don't want to feel small. I right. guess. Um, and. And that's fine. Like, he's also seen me do stand-up, so it's like, once someone's seen me do stand-up, then I'm fine. Um, but I'm just yeah. saying, like, I have that voice in my head, like the way you might have your mother's voice in your head judging right. you sometimes. I yeah. just have it as, like, a general judgment voice of, like, there's there's some comics, the dudes usually, there's some chicks too, but the bullying kind of people. There's some bullyish kind of people where, uh, you know, I could see them being like, what's Ariel doing? You know, but right. that's just that, that dumb voice we all have in our heads. Yeah, like, people is. are judging us. But it's also just at the outset right because after you get this podcast going and kind of get that 
right. that portion of your voice out in the world, then that perception is going to go away because right. Joe Rogan's a stand up comedian oh, totally. too. And no one's like, oh, what's Joe doing with the podcast? You no, know, just, yeah. You know what I mean? I th- exactly. So. That's, well, that's the part. I'm just at the vulnerable part can where. Beer, Lincoln, can you just grab me another beer, please? Sorry. I'm just at the uh, vulnerable part where it's like, oh, we don't have, you know, a huge listenership yet. We don't have enough right. ratings on Apple Pot, you know. Yep. Um, we're just getting started and I'm like working with the producer and we're trying to get our schedule. So we're even putting them out regularly. So we're just, you know, until it get well, once it gets big enough. Right. Then, of course, that's yes. not embarrassing. Makes total sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's just very sincere. And that feels like after these years of like being, uh, you know, a stand up and just like going and impressing people and being like, haha, you know, walking around like tough guy. There's mm-hmm. a little bit of a like. Oh yeah, let me start again. Or even building sure. up gender fluids to the point where you know we had a decent, um, uh, we have a decent following going and like some ratings on iTunes and stuff. You yeah. know, there's a little bit of that. Like I can whip my dick out and measure it with with plenty of people. And yeah. with this one, it's like start again and just right. put yourself. You know, you gotta self promote and be like, hey yes. guys, listen to my podcast. You know, it's just all vulnerable stuff. But I'm very. Um, I was watching this country as we were, you know, heading into this election, especially in this year and everything, and and just watching the divisiveness that people keep talking about. Um, Some of us are really talking about the divisiveness and wanting to do something about it, but it's like, well, what do we do about it? Um, And there are people now, I'm, you know, find more kind of centery podcasts where people are having those conversations. Um, But even a lot of the center people then kind of it'll just be like well now we're just making fun of the left mm. you know mm-hmm. and i'm like well i'm still not hearing really nuanced conversations with mm. original ideas where people are hashing things out and being vulnerable um even like joe rogan having on people like abigail schreier and deborah so and whatever and talking about like, like my favorite subject the gender shit um well, yeah, I'm glad that like p- people are having a platform to, like to have some of those conversations. But Joe is kind of a neutral character, basically. So we're not going to get he's not going to have a lot of perspective um, mm-hmm. to push back. Band. And he's also not having on like a trans woman to come in and like, let's have that conversation. Why don't mm-hmm. we have, uh, you know, and so one of the formats that I want to do sometimes on MAGA is to have a mediated conversation or if me as the mediator and two people who have a disagreement about yeah, something. I think that'd be great. Yeah, because I'm uniquely, I, I see people's perspectives, you know, mm-hmm. having been raised Mormon in Texas, being a gay, androgynous, lesbian, whatever my gender is, who cares, you know, um, I do see people's perspective. Mm-hmm. I don't have a hard, like, I, I have a lot of, like, conservatism in me, I have a lot of liberalism in me, you can all, I'm very opinion fluid, I just am empathetic to different scenarios, and I, and I want to hold space for all of that, and just, mm-hmm. like, figure this out together, I don't like this stuff of... Um, well, we're going to obfuscate the truth or like not talk about this part because it's politically expedient. Just it bugs the shit out of me. You know, Mm -hmm. like I want to have things out. Um, and I think that we can do that. And like my producer on MAGA is a, is a trans chick who was also raised Mormon. And she, you know, she and I don't agree. (laughs) There's some stuff where, or, you know, about, we don't agree about everything. Um, we definitely have some stuff, you know, where we can have some interesting conversations about gender from our different, you know, um, perspectives. Cause Mm -hmm. every single person has their own perspective. It's not just Mm -hmm. like what is true, but it's like, what is true for you? I'm not that I'm like just a a relativist in that way. I think there are some like (laughs) absolute truths, if you will, or like there's a concrete universe we're all sharing. Mm -hmm. Um, there's some physical laws and we're, that we all could figure out how to define to you know Mm -hmm. but also i don't have all the information because i need you know so she and i even just the other day we didn't record this conversation but started talking about some of the trans stuff and you know didn't um uh have the same thoughts and opinions Mm -hmm. yet but also we're able to like talk to each other and hear each other and learn from each other and and because we have love and respect for each other then, you know, and, and believe that the other has good intentions, we're able to figure these things out together and, and both walk away yeah. more open hearted, more yes. full hearted, more and with a, a rounder perspective. And I think like the gender stuff is, is my favorite subject because it's so interesting. It's so um, there, there's a lot going on. Like I'm smack in the middle of it with my own kind of gender situation. And but it, it's such something that I'm watching be so corrosive in mm-hmm. the culture. 
bigger and I think is getting bigger and bigger in terms of people. Uh, you know, we, one thing if the queers were just arguing amongst ourselves, queers and radical feminists were trying to be like, what are we going to, but it's uh, really, but people are paying attention more and more yeah. people are transitioning to something or other What parents are dealing with this. Um, and the conversations that are happening online, Twitter, uh, Reddit, Reddit shut down a lot of the interesting conversations. Hmm. Um, but you know, they're just not, healthy and mm-hmm. and and it's it's the craziest people usually on other sides who are the loudest because mm-hmm. uh, whether it's some kind of radical feminist who can't wait to just wants just hates trans people at this point or if it's trans people who think that it's okay to tell people to, to die choking on their girl dick you know there's just th- th- there's a lot of that and then mm-hmm. there's people who want attention and will say all kinds of stuff to get it atten- and you're like that's just not a great way to have those and so if we're going to be like if anyone is sincere, I guess this is why MAGA is vulnerable. I'm like, does anyone actually want us to get along besides me? Or is everyone addicted to right. how mad we are at each other? Is everyone addicted to how interesting all of this is? Does everyone want to be right when all these other people are stupid and wrong? Yeah. Because if we want that, we're going to keep getting it. And that's why I we agree. have these presidents that we're getting. That's why we have all this turmoil. Because this is who we are. We are the problem. Mm-hmm. We are the ones not only electing these people, but manifesting this because mm-hmm. this is who we are. I mean, Trump is uh, does embody a lot of the worst of a lot of us. Mm-hmm. Now there's, <laughs> I won't be like a Trump never did anything right kind of person. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's a lot of stuff that uh, I think was just straight up like useful that he mm-hmm. did. There's some stuff the Democrats have been selling all of us out for so long and we need to talk about that. But that's mm-hmm. the thing, like we don't have any good options yeah. and, and we're all fooled into hating each other. Yeah. Whereas we need to learn to love each other yes. so that we can figure out how to elect better people. Yep. I mean, it's I totally that agree. I agree 100%. That's partly why I like you that you're doing this podcast. And also, I like that you're doing the podcast because I feel like the perception might be that it might be surprising to some people considering your um, your kind of position and your viewpoints and your experiences that you would actually want to have a reasonable conversation around these matters. And what you said is like a, uh, what was the term? Like a mediated conversation. Yeah. I like that. I think that's the that's the term for it, right? Because if it's like you're going to host a debate, it's like, I don't know, we're kind of... Like there's deb- I feel like no, that's, debate. That why, just, we, why are we? That doesn't sound. That's such a dude idea. Yeah, Can we I just agree. put that there? Yeah. Like, oh, a debate. It's a good yeah. sports. Okay, okay. Exactly. Yeah. No, no, but if you can no. Let mommy, let mommy handle this. Yeah. Okay. And We're going to uh, look. Yeah. It's couples counseling for this country. Yeah, exactly. And I think you're the one to do that because I feel like it would take a lot for you to get. I don't know. I feel like it would take a lot for you to get uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah. I don't get uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. So that's a good position to be in hosting a podcast like that. Are you going to have all of them like that? Are you going to have just guests on or 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 are you going to sometimes just talk into the microphone by yourself? I mean, so all far, of the above or it, mostly potentially, because I know, you know, we, we don't have to have rules on podcasts, you know, but um, right now it's been me and a guest. Uh, or mean a couple of guests each time so far, just because that's been like, uh, first of all, there's a lot of people I just want to talk to, and right. it's too hard to like always find. Okay, well, we need someone that you disagree with, and then we're gonna, you know, that's a lot to coordinate, and yep. especially once COVID's over, I think it'll be easier to do some of that. Um, and I may do some where I'm talking into the mic. I don't know for whatever reason that still feels just weirder to me. Sure. Than, yeah, you I know. agree. Um, where do you see the, like the biggest divisiveness in America? Are you going to, do you think it's in the areas of sex and gender or is it right versus left politics? I guess they all kind of get together all, a little yeah. bit. But. Um, I mean, it's interesting. I think I, I don't, I can't tell if the, the sex gender, you know, area is, is the most contentious part or if that's just the part that I, you know, am like surrounded by all the mm-hmm. time. Um, I think it's one of the big ones right now, though. I mean, I think that abortion has t- has fallen. I think that used to be one of the big cultural war er- mm. areas. And I think that one is diminishing more and more people, more and more Catholics even are kind of evolving on the issue. Um, or just it's not the a biggest concern for them politically. They may have mm-hmm. for their preferences, but I, I don't think a lot of people are like fully just like, well, I'm going to hold my nose just because of abortion and vote sure. for this person. People, there's so much that's like the, the, the team politics has gotten so wrapped up in things that the abortion has, is almost just like a, another thing among there um, for people. I, and But uh, what, yeah, what is it that keeps people voting for Republicans at this point? I mean, I think that pe- some people are afraid that 
with the Democrats are are really going to listen to uh, the, the, the children who want to b- burn the whole thing down, mm-hmm. as if those those plutocrats want to burn the whole thing down, mm-hmm. um, or they're going to listen to the progressives who want too much uh, redistribution and that that's going to cripple our economy. Um, you know, I think. Th- some people are worried about that, but I mean, here you you can see what Joe Biden is doing. I mean, it's just the kind mm-hmm. of like business as usual. The Democrats they're, they're right. just going to influence pedal, get their line their own pockets, do very little for the people. Here's a few gestures. Yeah. Um, we're back to that. So I, that's what I like to me. I'm like this. This is really sad because if you are like a historical, like a Republican type of voter, maybe you're a Mormon, maybe you're, you know, or some kind of religious, um, or you just kind of are like, well, I want to preserve the good stuff. Mm-hmm. We at least don't want to lose that. I, yeah. It'd be good if we could make things better, but at the very least we want to try to hold on to what we've got. Cause no one has a clear vision of how we're getting to anything better. So I'm going to kind of just stick to that. And mm-hmm. by the way, they, on my news channels, they scare us about whatever the, trade deals are going to be or whatever. Right. And so, and I don't want to lose my job. <laughs> you know, I got oil, yep. I got an oil job. Right. I, I make six figures and I don't have a degree, you know, like, I mean that kind of stuff. Yep. There's just, it's, it's, it's that going on for people. But I think, I think particularly for religious voters um, and, and I think of my, my Mormons, you know, who, if you are like the default, it was understood that you were going to vote as a Republican as a Mormon oh, you know, really? growing up pretty okay. much. I mean, you were not supposed to, it wasn't supposed to be official, but sometimes it even kind of was okay. like, you know, <laughs> um, but I, I think of people who are now right now, if you're a religious person, if you're, if you really like want to be a good person who's serving the Lord, if you will, um, then who are you supposed to vote for? Mm-hmm. Who are you supposed to look around and go, you know, and, and there's a default right now for a lot of those people to vote Republican. And I think there, there's, you know, some reasons that kind of, k- kind of make sense for that. But for the most part, how, what a sad, what a sad state of affairs for those people. Yeah. Like th- this isn't a good person I'm voting for. This yep. isn't a servant of the Lord mm-hmm. I'm voting for right now. And I just feel like there are so many people who want to do good. Like I said, I think of my Mormons who, <laughs> what it must feel like to be told you're a Latter-day Saint who is supposed? It was whose soul was saved for these times, these tumultuous times, because you were going to help, you know, and or just to be someone who is who is like wanting to be a steward of the earth or whatever. And your choices right now suck, right. you know. And and so I'm just like, I want, I think I want to be a Republican, um, and just it, you know whatever that even means to be. Mm-hmm. I'm going to identify as a Republican. I'll be a trans Republican. Yeah. Um. And, and what I want to do is help the Republicans from mm-hmm. the inside. I don't mm-hmm. think I can help the Democrats. They're not, they're not savable mm-hmm. because, uh, because anyone who tries to speak the truth is just going to get burned at the stake. Mm-hmm. Whereas Republicans love truth. That's mm-hmm. why they like Trump. It's because he says just enough truth. Now he says a million other lies, mm-hmm. but there's just enough truth in there that you're like, finally, someone is saying right. something that smacks yeah. of truth to me. Yeah. Yep. Whereas these Democrats are all robots. Mm-hmm. You know, they are just parroting this stuff. And even when they sound genuine, the next debate comes by and someone has given them a script. Right. Yep. And and so that is so disgusting to us that we're like, yeah, we would rather have someone who at least sometimes says. So I'm like, well, if if Trump could get there with just a little bit of truth and that much hatred and fear and a mm-hmm. little bit of a sense of humor, mm-hmm. what if we have a sense of humor and all the truth that we can get our hands on yeah. and are good and just want love and together, you know, like we want to be, love each other and have American pride again. Yes. You know, that's the thing. The Democrats won't even have America. It's, it's anathema to them. It's against their religion to love America. Mm-hmm. And that is something that I just can't, that it's not. <laughs> t- Any ideas why that is? Because I picked up on that too. And I'm just, I'm not sure that I understand why that is. How, how did America sort of get lumped in with the right wing conservatism a little bit? Well, okay. Because for one thing, Democrats are so cosmopolitan that um, they anything that's kind of like uh, America first or, we, you know, we want to um, keep jobs here or anything, that's they, so many people were fooled into thinking like, oh, you, that's either racist or you just don't. Why would you care about the people in your own country more than, say, a random person in Ethiopia, who I also oh, don't okay. do anything for, by the way, uh, you know, and it's... And, and it's like, well, because you, you're not actually going to do anything for the Ethiopians, mm-hmm. but you might do something for your neighbor, mm-hmm. you know? And, and like, so if we, and those people can take care of each other, whatever, yeah. but we can have, and it doesn't have to be America first, fuck everybody else. Let's, right. let's ruin them. Exactly. But it can be like, well, this is our nation, our tribe. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and by the way, 
having pride as American is the way that was the whole plan with the founding so that disparate peoples could work together as a nation. Mm -hmm. We could go, yeah, we might wind up being different religions and races and all kinds of stuff. But instead of a, uh, an ethnic identity binding us together, instead of a religious identity binding us together, the idea of America is going to bind us together. Right. This is the right. flag that we're all going to be yep. so that we can be a diverse nation mm -hmm. where we can all love each other because you are American, I am American. Mm -hmm. you know? And that is the idea. That is the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, that is the idea. But somehow we've allowed this idea that we're going to allow America to bind us together to be an ethnic issue or to... You know, right. to speak to How, other identities. Well, that the, like that's what we need to that's what we right. need to work against. That's that, what we need to fix. Exactly. And that's what I'm saying. That's why I would rather go into the Republican Party and remind them that we are all brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. and that's what it means. Okay. That's what and by the way, if you're a Christian, that's what it means. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're just an American, like this, th we love each other and mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what anybody, how different anybody else is in any way. This, this is our tribe. Yes. As, and, and I can't get the Democrats to realize that it's through uh, identifying as American. It's through loving the, f our country that we mm -hmm. can love each other, mm -hmm. that that's the way to love each other so that we do have something that binds us together. So yeah. that we're all okay. on the same team. Yep. We can't get them to, to understand that you have to be on the same team to love each other. They just, Okay. Do you also think the Democrats are sort of, I hate to say anti-America, although sometimes it seems like they are a little bit, or they're, they're, they're scared of, they shy away from the patriotism stuff, which again, it can get overdone, right? People right. can get over patriotic and gets a little bit weird. Do you think they shy away from that because they can't get past some of the times that America has messed things up in its history? Like slavery, obviously being one of the biggest ones, right? Right. We should have never done that. Of course, but I mean, you looking through every nation, and I mean, there's they all com have committed atrocities. I mean, exactly. back in the day, that yep. was just what it was. It was a dog eat dog world, and the moralities were different because that was the norm. We were all taking mm -hmm. over land and killing each other mm -hmm. and whatever. Now we've all like all started. Re re now everyone reads, and we've all thought about things. We have philosophers, right. and people are going. Oh, okay. Maybe we could stop killing each other, and we could learn how to live in more harmony. You know, but but at the time that just wasn't a thing. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I can forgive America of our sins just the way. I mean, it's just like it's a myopic understanding of of world history. You know, a lot of people think that America. It's like they think that they were the only people who ever had slaves. It's like well, right. You know, yep. or or the only people who ever killed each other. <laughs> There's, mm -hmm. it, by the way, you know, it was like thirty thousand years ago. Some like Mongolians came over the land bridge and got here, and then eleven thousand years ago, the people who we now think of as Native Americans killed them or intermarried. And there's a, you know, yep. people were just moving around and killing each other and intermarrying and mixing, and that was just what it was. Yep. You know, it's just that. Uh, the Europeans happened to be at a time in history. You know, they were the ones who got the boats and the guns and, you know, but these are yep. accidents of history and all kinds of people would have done all kinds of things. And it's just, and not just accidents, but it has to do with the strength of um, the religions that were uh, powerful tools to bind people together into these. I mean, mm -hmm. but this is just, it's like, what are we supposed to blame people for n acting out their natural human instincts in right. the past? Yeah. You know, yep. it doesn't matter. And they, by the way, did some amazing things in, in, in the terms of world history to change the way governments are run. So we can be proud of that stuff. And, and like, there's a, there's so much to be genuinely proud about. Even Thanksgiving, there was a version of it that did go that well. Mm -hmm. You know, there's atrocities, but there's also an actual times when the American natives were helping the sailors get there and be like, yeah, True. this is how you plant the crops. It's and true. then they were so grateful the first year that the crops yep. did come in and they actually did have that together. Yes. I mean, yep. now, now you're supposed to just not believe any of it. Um, Whereas, you know, and, and I got, I was listening to like a, an American native person's podcast the other day, or, like on Thanksgiving where she was talking about that mm -hmm. and like giving history lessons about it all. So it's like, it's not just some white person's book that I read, you know? Yeah. And by the way, real quick on that, is that podcast on native American history? Cause if so, I'm curious what it's called. It's actually a lot about food. It's called Twisted uh, Sister. And okay. it's, so it's about like, yeah, uh, okay. cuisine and I'm, I'm really into food. So I thought, ah, yeah. Because I've been trying to have someone on the podcast to like go deep into Native American history, so I didn't That's know if the podcast idea. was about that. Um, all right, so you you at this point you see more hope for the Republican Party than you do for the Democratic Party, or do you just yeah. align more 
naturally with the Republican Party than you do the Democratic Party. You know, I don't really know who I align more with. Um, I I just see more hope for okay. Republicans. I think there's so many people on Team Red yep. who um, who do hunger and thirst after truth mm-hmm. for one. I so I think I can that. speak yeah. to them because I won't get canceled by the by the, the right. Okay. The the left will you know I'll say one true thing and they'll cut my feet off. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, so so I think that. They, they hunger after truth. There's a lot of people, who, like I said, who are deeply religious and, and want to serve the Lord, serve the common good, make the world a better place. Um, and I think I can speak to those people. Like that's mm-hmm. a clear, they have like kind of ideas about moralities that are, that are broader than um, the average, the, the average liberal person's ideas are basically like, is it, is it, is, can I see a direct harm to someone else? Can I, if it's not one step, like not obviously immediately me hurting someone else, mm-hmm. then it must be morally okay. But they're not ever thinking about the bigger picture of like, well, what is the effect on society of that? Right. What are the kind of consequences, outgrowth? What does that do to you if you watch that much porn? Mm-hmm. And then how do, what does that do to everyone else? I mean, so that's how I see it. Like, I just don't, I, I, they're postmodern on the left side or they're mm-hmm. children who don't understand anything. And the children, Children, you know, used to be you would be in your early twenties and you would be an idealist and you would have all these ideas, but you you would you would be listening to older people enough mm-hmm. of the time and eventually would kind of. But now they're just raising each other on TikTok. It's true, and yeah. so they're not getting it, and then they're yep. getting and, and Tumblr and every and they spread their ideas and their ideas are spreading amongst each other, uh, and and there's not an they're not listening to enough real adults mm-hmm. to uh, to make their ideas better. And in fact, once the real adults start saying anything that hurts their feelings, I mean, this is a little bit. Of it, you know, overgeneralizing, but this happens a lot. Their feelings get hurt. They cancel them. They call mm-hmm. for their heads. Mm-hmm. Someone writes an op-ed article, and now it's they're unsafe at the New York Times. I mean, it's just insanity, and it's children, and they the, no one is. I mean, these are spoiled. This is an empire of spoiled children. But I think on the right, there the, there's a lot of people who aren't that spoiled. Mm-hmm. They might have um, some different ideas than me about whatever. Yep. But there's not this kind of like attitude of. I mean, and there's so many people on the left. Where I'm like. Especially once they're a little bit socialist or they have ideas about, uh, yeah, what should be funded or not or who should lose their job if they won't do this or that. And it's like, you're not willing to do the work, okay? Mm -hmm. Do you know how your vegan ice cream gets to the store? Do you know, like, people have to do the jobs. Yes. And I think that that is lost to so many people on the left. And I, they think they're, they're, they know how to hold the clipboards and tell people, you know, how we're going to run the society. They have no clue yeah. about any of the billion people. And I barely have a clue, but I just know how much I don't know. Right. You yeah. know? And so I just feel a deep gratitude to people who are who are working 60 hours a week mm-hmm. as truckers or, you know, who are who are starting businesses that, that are doing things. That, you know, like I have a gratitude to this American economy. I love the vegan ice cream. I love that vegan ice cream right now is four dollars for chocolate peanut butter cookie dough. Yeah, that wasn't the case a few years ago. You know, <laughs> I like we live in this amazing. Uh, I look at all the flavors of kombucha that you can buy on the way to your protest. Yeah. <laughs> And Praise it, God for that. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, I, I do love this country. I would like there to be a bigger safety net. I think I could I think I could eventually talk Republicans into being like, well, look, we could work together. I think every, it's crazy. So, so so here's something for Republicans. Um, look, I don't want anyone's like I get it. If you have a job and you want to be taken away and you don't want to hear that your oil job, you know, like mm-hmm. I think we can still figure out how to transition eventually right. to better, cleaner stuff. But like try to help people like be able to look trans people are going to kill themselves if they don't get to transition. But you want this guy to lose his job mm-hmm. where he makes one hundred thousand dollars and is and has four kids. You know what I mean? Like he's going to kill himself. Right. Okay. Like let's, let's be a little empathetic, but at the same time you go into red establishment, you know, you're in the country or you're in the North Austin or something, you're at a bar and they put in two straws as a default into your cup. Now, come on. Can we just ask if someone wants a straw? Mm. It's the kind of thing where you're like, what are you being antagonistic toward even saving the earth. Right. Like you're being demonstrative, you're being childish. There's so many things like that on the right where I'm like, let's clean up. Look, if we're the, if we're the team of the good, the good Christians or whatever your kind of moral, moral system is, if you are like, you have this idea like that you're better, you know, like we're the adults in the room, we're mature, we're, we're good moral people. And as opposed to those atheist, hedonist, whatever, you know, like then let's be good. Yeah. I totally agree with that. I, I agree with, that a hundred percent um and by the way is this idea from the left that they're kind of making these decisions that aren't kind of borne out in reality is that where we're getting a lot of this double-faced stuff like nancy pelosi 
with the haircut thing and Gavin Newsom going to dinner party without his mask. And wasn't it even the mayor of Austin that was in Cabo saying, don't go anywhere for Thanksgiving, like that type of thing? Like the, the, the ones that have stepped in it, at least the last three or four politicians I've seen step in it have been from the left. Is that why? I think, because I, I, I mean, I don't know how deep in their own asses those people are. I don't know if they're... Um if if they are just kind of being like, <laughs> tell the peasants not to go out, but obviously we'll have our dinner parties. Yeah. I don't know if it's like that or if it's just kind of what I see from all my liberal friends, like where everybody, especially for a long time now, I feel like everyone's loosening up. But for a long time, everyone was acting like oh, uh, we're being so careful and we're doing all of it. And then when I like look into their lives a bit, I'm like, okay, well, yeah, but then you're having this party and that's okay. fine. And you're yeah. going in there. I mean, look, some people are really, really careful. There's people who haven't hugged anyone in nine months now. There is, yeah. <laughs> mostly no, in LA, right. but yeah. they don't realize the rest of us are like living, you know? That is true. Yeah. yeah. They're on Twitter still going, guys, what are you doing? It's not, it's been nine months and I've not, I haven't touched another soul. How yes. are you guys taking it? And we're all like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we're hugging. We're playing in the street. Our kids are playing. We yeah, have a exactly. group. I mean, yeah. we try. There's some, you know, there's precautions that are taken. There are things that we all do. Mm-hmm. We, you know, we have modified our lives. But at the same time, you know, we're recognizing that there are higher goods, too, than just like preventing every single death that there could possibly be in this one way. But like yeah. the fact that society could be breaking down and also, yeah. you know, yeah, freedoms that you give up. It's hard to give back. Like there's, there's so many factors going on every time you make any kind of moral choice. But again, that's why. Team Blue is so frustrating because they're mm. like children who are like you're either, you're killing people or you're being you're like mm-hmm. th- that's really the only way to think of it and it's like no um, if we don't get together and have comedy shows then people are not going to laugh and and like laugh at these kind of ideas that are in the political me- middle where we're all mm-hmm. realizing we have more in common than you would uh, you would think if you spent nine hours a day on Twitter because you're at home and you're <laughs> you know like not going out at all yeah. Um, so those uh, yeah things are important, but I think that the I think that Nancy and the, all them you know probably have uh, their own idea of like well I can go to this thing or that well here's why I have an exception. Everyone makes exceptions for themselves morally. Mm, um, that's when true. They, you know people yeah. steal a little, people take a little, people break some rules, and you just tell yourself well that's because well it's important that I go to this dinner party. You know. Yeah. Yep, that's true. Um, all right, so what would be some things you would ch- what would be some things you would change on the Republican Party side, at least perception wise? Like the one thing that comes to mind is somehow the Republican Party have allowed themselves to have this kind of this sort of racist stigma to them. Yeah, which is again, it's sort of weird when you think about. It. Like, well, let's just take take Trump for example. I mean, he's done more for the African American community than most other presidents have. Okay, tell me what but, you mean by that. Well, lifetime funding for HBCUs, the African American community is has made their median income has been best over the last four years, and it's really been in the past. Now, I don't know actually if he. I have no idea if Trump's racist or not. Well, I'll you just, also can't just just like say directly that. say that the, the, their median income raised because of him. But I mean, just to stipulate. Well, but, rising tide does raise all ships, and the economy right. Was so good there's some Trump. some so amount of is, that. There is. I just that. wanted to know what people um, meant you, yeah. him and you when you said that. Yeah, yeah. but what I think lifetime it, funding is in with HBCUs. So they used to have to go back to the president every single year and say, "Hey, can we have more money?" And he said, "No, you just get money for a lifetime." Okay. So, so but a, however, Trump himself and the Republican Party does sort of have. They've allowed this kind of racist stigma to be attached. Right. Right. What do they need to do to fix that? Because I feel like I feel like the stigma is stronger than the reality. I could be wrong on that front. Well, I mean, I don't know. Are there a lot of speeches that Republican types are making where they're saying like where they're really talking about how um, all of the immigrants enlisting kind of countries or whatever make us stronger um, that, you know, uh, and and promoting and bringing up and showing stories and the, and the advertisements, you know, like uh, you could put more people in advertisements. I mean, until people see that, until they pe- people see um, people of various races, you know, being elected in the Republican Party mm-hmm. um, more and more, there's some of it, of course, then there's going to be that. I mean, there are, and, and we need stronger voices uh, that are uh, non-American Europeans because, you know, someone like Candace Owens, then once she gets into the spotlight, because it's like, oh, yeah, here's a black woman who's not uh, who who's not on, you know, who's like railing against the team blue. That's fun. Mm -hmm. But she gets then she gets rewarded for saying the more polemic things, more incendiary Mm -hmm. things. And so she then she leans into that. And so there's some amount, some of the stuff she says, like, I'm totally on board with other stuff. I'm like, all right, well, you're doing this. It's kind of like with any culture, any of these people, like there's truth there. But the message is going to is going to hit some people because it's fun 
fun and but they but you're playing on their hatred feeling you know, you're playing mm-hmm. on their dark side mm-hmm. in order to then get because it's so much easier and I get it <laughs> it's like it's so much easier to play on people's dark side and be like aren't those people fucking stupid and dumb mm-hmm. you know um, and if instead we need people who you know and, and Republicans in general and then you know uh, non uh, European kind of people to uh, to to come to prominence in the Republican Party and be I elevated who yes. are you know and there are like people <laughs> there are a lot of thinker you know people who could be elevated um, instead of the Candace Owens types but that's mm-hmm. why I say like this country you know we deserve it because what we elevate uh, the voices we elevate whether on Twitter or in social you know other social media or in the media it's whatever are the ones who are the most divisive and who are sa- yep. who are the ones punking on other people yep. on because both sides because they get the views and the clicks and all that right like, so what yeah, we yeah. It's, it's so I like uh, everyone this year vote 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 oh my god vote Oh my God, vote. And it's like, yeah. okay, yes, vote, please, um, for a million reasons. But also, then the next day and every day and yesterday as well, like, vote with your time and mm-hmm. your attention and your mm-hmm. energy and your dollars. Like, the real votes 100%. are every moment of our lives, how yes, we treat 100%. each other. Yep. Like, everything that we do is our vote, but everything you retweet, everything that you like, everything that you amplify in those ways is your vote. And if you're sitting there going, oh my God, look at this thing on YouTube. And like, you know, it's like, that's mm-hmm. that's who we are. That's what mm-hmm. th- that's what it is. And so what we elevated, and even, and so I would say too like if you are on the left like Kamala Harris okay I think that she's got a lot of just cynical robot actor in her um, but the thing is what she wants what Trump wants uh, I know this like when they get I watch them with a, a mic in their hand and an audience and they want to be loved the same mm-hmm. way I want to be loved that's the way comedians are too this is the same impulse of these are we are narcissists who mm-hmm. who like holding a microphone and getting people to love us but in in a political context it's like yeah, audience, what are you going to cheer for? Because if you will cheer for different things, you can change who Kamala That's is. That's true. It's, yeah. they, they are playing to us. Yet they're going to lead us as well to some extent, mm-hmm. you know, but a lot of it is them playing to us. And so if we want them to be good people, we have to be good people. Mm-hmm. That's what they're going to respond to. Totally agree. When the, with the racism stigma on the Repu- Republican Party, where it could be, where an indication that the issue could actually be bigger than I think it is, is to me, it seems like a simple fix, right? It's like get more people, get a more, get more diversity in the Republican party's leadership. Talk more about those types of things. Talk more about racial justice, social justice, those types of things. However, maybe they're not talking about it because, or not getting more people in of diverse um, diversity into leadership because they know it would estrange or kind of push some away of the, some of their votes. And if that's her. true, then now we do have a big problem. We have a big because problem. it shouldn't exactly. be that. I was thinking more in terms of like, well, this is a simple fix. Just get more diversity and leadership. Talk more about these things. However, if by doing that, they're Look, estranging some of their of votes, all, then that's not what are those people going to do? Vote for the Democrats, please. Okay. So you don't, okay. they don't okay. have to worry that's about that, point. really. That's a very good I think point. What yeah. we need to do is have a little bit of faith in people and play to their highest uh, character mm-hmm. and not their lowest. Mm-hmm. I think that's you know we need to have some trust and say, look, I think I think Republicans and I think all political leaders should do this. You need to go back to a little bit of a JFK thing, like ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I mean, the Democrats could use that, mm-hmm. um, but we all should be doing that. The political leaders should be saying to people, like, you know what, we are going to have to work. Okay, we all need to be better people. We need to, you know, yeah, I want you to keep your job. But we're going to have to make some changes in order to fix mm-hmm. the, you know. Mm-hmm. And also, like, hey, things have been unfair for people. We want to make it better, but in a sustainable way. Um, so, yeah, we're going to fund the HBCUs. But yeah. also, we need to figure out how to get some uh, better pre-K for people. We need to fix education. Yes. Um, yep. well, we need to tell people, like, hey, life is also hard work. And you need to, I, you mm-hmm. know, I think there's not enough personal responsibility preached on the right anymore either. Mm-hmm. The right wants mm-hmm. to tell the left that there's no personal responsibility, but it's like, well, I'm not hearing that. But leaders should be inspiring us to be our best selves. Um, yep. And so, yeah, there should be, it, it should be really like overt. It should be really like direct saying to people like, Hey, there's no place for racism in the Republican party. Yes. Guys, we are all Americans together and we want this yes. tent wide and anyone who wants to be on this team who believes in hard work, who believes in, um, that tradition has a lot there for us that uh, when we talk, and first of all, we need to go back to saving the earth. That was a whole campaign yeah, that got derailed. That. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that we should be, um, 
treating each other well. I, I lost my point because I got distracted about the environment and how pissed off I am. Well, okay. So, um, but let's talk about the environment. So why, why does it seem like the Republican party has such a problem with saving the earth? It's like, this is basic guys. We're like, okay. If you just go back in time, the industrialist society was not always here. Right. And then we got all this stuff and we had these factories and we made all of these things, but we're are We are on this earth and there is like only so many resources here. Let's take care of this as we go. Why does it seem to be cool on the right to sort of not care about the environment, not care about the earth? I don't fully understand that. It's it, it's sort of like a signaling. It's sort of like oh, so pro business that we don't care. Like business at the expense of all else. I'm not entirely There's sure what it is. A few factors. Um, so there was a big push. At some point, there was this dude who was like uh, evangelical, and he was like, "Guys, I mean, it says here we're stewards of the earth. Um, it, you know, this should be our real thing. We should be the ones who are environmentally conscious and mm-hmm. and 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 care about this. Like, that's the right thing to do. This is God's planet." Um, there was. I can't remember how, but they, they basically canceled him. Somebody, I think there was big business. He did a, he did like a, a, a magazine cover where they convinced him to like, look like he was walking on water. And then they, and they ran these headlines that were like, Oh, look at this guy thinks he's Jesus. And like basically because of this one guy who had really built up the evangelicals to start caring about the earth, then they canceled him and then the whole thing fell apart mm-hmm. and they've been like anti ever since. There were some powers that are that, you know, the money <laughs> was going to be taken from them if uh, Republicans were all wanting to <laughs> care about theirs. So yep. um, they, people have just been manipulated. It's really sad. It's really disgusting. Evangelical. They, and, and But a lot of people, I mean, I'm even gr- growing up Mormon. I mean, there was some idea that, well, the rapture slash the second coming or whatever is about yes, to come. Yes, I think that's totally part yeah. of what it is. Well, it, it makes people... With some of it anyway. Even if they wouldn't tell you that or don't fully consciously subscribe to them, like, well, fuck it, I'm just going to litter and who cares? You know, it's right. not like that. It's just more like it's just enough in the back of their heads to be like yeah but it doesn't really matter because eventually jesus is coming back yeah maybe that's maybe that's an underlying issue with the with the conservative right in that regards Mm -hmm. i don't know by the way i i don't really i don't know that much about global warming so i don't really know i know there's some questions on like there's some different viewpoints on like how much are we actually contributing there or not i mean it would seem to me we're probably contributing a little bit if you just look at these factories that we put up and see the the results well, it's of also just like overfishing uh, I, don't know. I mean forget global exactly. warming you know like we don't have any in fish Africa. yeah there's stuff Those, like yeah. there's resources yeah. well, animals are extinct and going more and more extinct all the time and and, and water is going to be a big issue it already is there's already people share, you know you know not being able to have as much water they want in California and in Arizona I mean Arizona has sold some land to Saudi Arabia which they use to grow hay um, so that they can take it back to Saudi Arabia right well so the, hmm. they, the farmers in Arizona around them um, no longer have enough water Water because the Saudi Arabians just come in and drill deeper. So you can't, you could just keep going deeper and get no all the kidding. water. So even if you're not on their land, you just go lower. You just keep going. That's all yours. So the wealthier you are, the the digger, the, the farther you can afford to dig. This is and happening in Arizona now? It happened years ago because Dang. the short term thinking people in Arizona right. mm-hmm. needed the money. And so they sold out and the farmers all came and said, please don't let them. They'll just dig deeper and we won't yep. have any water. And sure enough, yeah, that's what happened. And yep. But that's the kind of thing we're already doing. Um, and so we, and water is just a big one. The factory farming that we're doing, we're stripping the land of any of the, the topsoil. And so the water runs right off into the ocean again. This could all be fixed if all of the farms in America had an inch of topsoil. Mm-hmm. Um Something Joel Saladin said, I think. Um, so it's like we have to be doing sustainable things. We, but we all need to live, <laughs> learn to live in harmony with uh, each other in the world. Like that should mm-hmm. be our goal is to figure out how to do this sustainably. Like I want to eat meat too. Like I, you know, um, but we need to figure out how to either grow the vegan meat, I guess, or, um, or have something where we go, okay, guys, you can't eat <laughs> meat three meals a day. Okay. Yeah. Some of you yeah. are morbidly obese and shouldn't be eating most of what you're eating. Yeah. We and work on that. You know what I mean? We all got to have to live. <laughs> and by the way, we got to talk That'll about definitely get you votes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell Republican. Well, that's part of it though. Like, okay. You want to talk about morality? Yes, it is a moral better. It's morally better to be in shape so that you're not going to cost yeah. as much, you know, so that you don't need to eat as much food. So you're not farting as much as ever, you know, so that you're not costing the community, healthcare. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very expensive 
to do, to deal with all this shit. You know, yeah, it, it would be better. Yeah. And you can contribute more to the group if you are healthy. So, yeah. you know, when people, I'm not hurting anybody. Yeah, but you're doing, you're doing more harm and less good than you could be doing. Yeah, it's true. It's true. All right. So let me, can I just say I'm a little bit surprised by where you stand politically? I mean, I don't, I <laughs> me don't too. know that we differ at all. Most but people like, don't. Nobody, have, nobody disagrees with me. Everything I say is like everyone's like, yeah, that's what we all oh, think. Really? Yes, okay. and I'm like, look, so let's figure where we are. The majority. This is what everyone. We all kind of generally. I mean, we might have a little bit of a disagreement about this, that, or the other, but mostly we all have the, kind of the same vision. But the people who are in the social media and the corporate media are putting these two narratives out. Okay. We all hate those people. Yep. And we have to take our country back. So do you think that we can take it back with a third party or do you think we need to go take over the, the best remaining I thought party about which you're thinking it needs to be Republican and go in and change it? I or? was thinking third party for a while, but dude, they have ways to kill it. It always dies. It just doesn't work. Um, and I think that our best bet is the Republicans because mm. the Democrats are too splintered. They're the infighting. They will tear each other down. Mm-hmm. You can't, you know, you wouldn't be able to, you, they'll just cancel you. Um, but th- that's not what happens on the team red. Um, and, and again, I think people will respond to truth. So I think that we can, we just have to figure out how to elevate these messages mm-hmm. um, because this is where most people are. When you talk to people one-on-one, most people are pretty much like this where, you know, even with just take trans shit, it's just this simple. Okay. Let's just all be kind to everybody, but we're going to have to talk about sports. We're going to have to talk about children, mm-hmm. you know, like let's, that's where everybody's at, sure. you know? Okay. So it, none of the stuff that divides people, it's like, no, it divides people online. Mm-hmm. It divides people if they're only listening, you know, they're watching these news programs. Mm-hmm. Um, but even the people who, when you watch that, when you go talk to them, it's like everyone's reasonable. We all just want to get along and figure out how we can have good lives together. But you're saying a lot of people share your viewpoints, which are very aligned with mine, by the way. But and but you're in, you're in like the more, <clears throat> I don't know, I guess I would say progressive community than I would sure. be probably. Like, <clears throat> like you would know... It's safe to say, like, you know more lesbian and gay people than I do, probably, probably. right? Probably. Are they sharing these political viewpoints? A lot of them as well? I mean, well? like, name a political viewpoint. I mean, I would have just thought, like, you're, you're, the people you know would have been a little farther left-leaning. See, I think but what you're saying, you say viewpoints, but, like, are we even talking about any partic- thing in particular? Or are you talking more about, like, my tone and my, um, my general, like, hopes and attitude? Because I think it, yeah, it's... it's yeah, what are you talking about? Like, what, when, when should abortion be legal, or how should we do it? Like, no, but most people aren't even thinking these things through as much. Mm-hmm. They might kind of just generally be in Team Blue, um, but then if I say it to them and I say, "Yeah, wouldn't it be good if we could help people keep their jobs and whatever?" But we all learn how to like do our part to try to make this better mm-hmm. and work toward. But everyone will say like. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what I believe. But it's like you just have to present to people a reasonable option. But what's presented is only like these people are bad and stupid. These people are bad and stupid. Mm -hmm. And and, and, and they can also agree with you on that. But like, you know, most people when we say like I say what they generally agree, it's like they generally are good people who mean well. Yes. Who when are presented with the option to go with truth and or a good plan or like oh that's Mm -hmm. a compromise it makes sense Mm -hmm. people will want that yeah i mean but do you find that like most people if they would hear that you feel like there's a little bit more hope at this point the republican party is easier to fix or Mm -hmm. closer to being fixed or there's even a little bit more hope on the republican party than democratic party like that statement alone i have do you find a lot of people are surprised when you say that what's what's surprising to me is how unsurprised people are and how people are going, yes, Ariel, that's it. Oh my really? God, this makes so much sense. Yes, huh. gay people, people on the left, people who are, because a lot of the people on the left, so to speak, are like me. We're like, we're all just like, are, we live these liberal lives. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we live in cities and with careers that are, whatever. But, uh, you know, what, what does it really mean to be on the left? I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know. They might have somewhat more of a, a liberal heart you know, temperament kind of than you. But um, yeah, when the people that I have presented this to and probably, you know, I mean, some of these are my closer friends and, and whatnot. And so they know me pretty well. But still, most of these people are on the left and they're saying like, oh, my God, that sounds so right. That sounds mm-hmm. like what should happen. Like, mm-hmm. that makes so much sense. Ariel, that's beautiful. So yeah. Um, I, mean, yeah. I feel a little bit instructed by that, to be honest, because I would not have thought that was the case. Like, I wouldn't have guessed these would be your political viewpoints. Yeah. 
No, I just wouldn't have. Like, I wouldn't have thought. I mean, first of all, I don't know that I that I care a ton. Like, I'm not <laughs> super into politics. If like if you had a different viewpoint, it really wouldn't offend me. Right. Um, but it's partly why I wanted to have you on. Like, you you have a very kind of a different. Well, you do have a not kind of. You have a very different lifestyle and probably very different beliefs than I had. And I wanted to kind of like learn more. You know, that's why I so. thought it was funny when you emailed me and you said, you know, that you know, because you're straight white conservative or something. You know, however you described yeah. it, you're like, so we probably differ a lot. And I'm 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 just reading that, going, you're about to see how much we have in common. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Huh. That's uh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, I'm really glad I had you on. Thank yeah, you for your time. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Great. Um, what else do you want to talk about? Oh, oh, we're going to keep talking? Great. <laughs> no, no I thought you were ending. I mean, that <laughs> I sounded like an ending. It. I wanted to gracefully <laughs> be like, oh, great. Good to see you too. Okay. Yeah. Um, Beautiful name, by the way. Ariel. Ariel, thanks. Yeah. It's a great name. Yeah, it's uh, it's good. I'm glad that I my parents gave that to me because, uh, you know, a lot of people have either a boring name or like the, the short hair lesbian types get some kind of like femme name, you know, like something ridiculous. Like Stephanie wouldn't be... Then what am I going to call myself, you know? So <laughs> Ariel is good because it's like nice. It's already like a cutesy androgynous name. Like it's, yeah. like, it's a name that the trans like non-binary people haven't like thought of it yet, but it would be a perfect little okay. non-binary name. Okay. So you think you know? we're going to hear more Ariels, you think? Uh, probably. I mean, it's okay. already happening because so because mine's A-R-I-E-L-L-E, which used to be very rare. I was born a little bit before the Little Mermaid, so then the, okay. the Little Mermaid spelling kind of started become a little bit more popular, and you'll see some of that. But then, it's like, there's an A R I L L E club a little bit where you, you, if people who are a few years younger than me or older, like, where your parents were really ahead of their time because this, what our parents did was this is the French feminization of a Hebrew male name, so it didn't really exist, and they. Really? Like, yeah, it's kind of cool and creative thing that they did. Like, my parents had never seen the name spelled like mine, but Ariel okay. Sharon was in the news, and my mom had a professor named Ariel, and um, so they just, you know, they just took that and did that. And so, these are like parents who have an education level, let's say, you mm-hmm. know, who are coming up with that. So there are a lot of A R I L L E people who are kind of like. Uh, getting a little bit famous in mm-hmm. various fields mm-hmm. um, and you can kind of see us so we're all kind of doing some cool stuff and I just know one of us is going to break and like become real famous <laughs> and then people are going to be naming their kids Ariel like this left and right and also if it's not kids it's just going to be little you know non-binary people yeah. <laughs> being like but that's the thing like I don't have to identify as non-binary because my parents already gave me this great non-binary name yeah love it well thanks for being on the podcast truly I appreciate you coming over spending your time you you know, showing the trust that you showed on us, you know, having different beliefs on some things. It turns out we believe a lot of the same things, I think, at least politically. And um, thank you very much. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers.